Hello, fellow misfits. This Sunday we're going full throttle on true horror stories. So if your curiosity beckons you into the realm of unexplained creatures and spine-chilling encounters, then you're in for a treat. Thank you for your support. Do subscribe. And now... Story time. I was stationed at McGuire Air Force Base for a while, and in 2013, a friend and I were leaving the dorms to walk over to the dining facility. It's about a two-minute walk, and since we worked mornings, it was around 5.30. As soon as we hit the pavement of the parking lot, we heard the laughter of a little girl. Despite not seeing anyone, we just looked at each other, attributing it to the wind, or maybe a deer. Fast forward a month, I'm in my car at night time, and the light on my phone is reflecting off the driver's side window. I thought I saw someone standing outside the car, but upon looking, there was no one there. I chalked it up to me scrolling on Facebook. After a few more minutes of scrolling, I got out, and to my surprise, there's a little girl standing in front of the dumpster with a white dress and a whitish hat. She laughed and ran around the dumpster. Now I was slightly scared because the laugh was the same one I had heard a month prior. But I was also concerned, thinking there were a few families that lived on base, and maybe this girl was a dependent, around 8 years old. It was cold, so I looked behind the dumpster where I thought she was hiding, but no one was there. I circled the area twice, and then my other friend came out, asking what I was doing. I shared the story with her and she helped me look in one of the abandoned buildings right next to ours. I thought there was no way this little girl could be fast enough to run into the building by the time I got behind the dumpster. However, after an extensive search, we found nothing. A ghostly encounter with the mysterious girl remains unexplained. The next story wasn't mine, but it happened to a friend of mine who was previously stationed in Guam. He mentioned being on the second floor of a three-story building, and his neighbors upstairs would consistently run around at night. Assuming they were on opposite shifts, he decided to leave a note on their door, kindly asking them to stop. However, the noise persisted. The following night, he resorted to hitting the ceiling with a broom and knocking on their door. There was no answer, but he could hear them running inside. Frustrated, he called the landlord, who happened to be drunk at a party. The landlord, after being picked up, was briefed on the situation during the drive back. However, to their surprise, the landlord claimed not to rent out to anybody. Upon returning to the apartment, they heard the running again on the way up the stairs. Suspecting someone squatting or illegally renting the space, the landlord angrily opened the door, ready to confront the supposed trespassers. Much to their bewilderment, no one was there. They checked every room, closet, cabinet, and even the ceiling. Security forces were called, but they found nothing. Ghosts. The last story isn't mine either, but it involves someone I was deployed with in Kuwait. During a shift change, our captain briefed us, advising to challenge anyone who seemed out of place. A few days later, a fellow soldier stood up and reported seeing someone near the NCO's sleeping buildings. He didn't recognize the uniform and approached the individual, but the person disappeared into the fog, eluding him. He emphasized that it wasn't anyone whose uniform he had worked with during his time there, considering we collaborated with several other countries. Strikingly, the description of the uniform closely matched what the Air Force wore during the Gulf War. Naturally, the collective conclusion was leaning towards the supernatural, perhaps encountering a ghost once again. The biting Arctic wind cut through the layers of my gear as our helicopter descended onto the desolate ice-covered landscape. The frigid air stung my face, a stark contrast to the warmth of the briefing room, where Commander Anderson had informed us of our mission. A group of Navy SEALs, led by me, Anthony, an occasional camper, were sent to investigate the mysterious disappearance of scientists at a U.S. research facility in the Arctic. As we touched down on the snowy ground, 
The bleak expanse of the Arctic greeted us. The research facility loomed in the distance, a solitary outpost against the icy backdrop. Our team disembarked, each member adjusting their gear, prepared for the unknown that awaited us. Approaching the facility, an eerie silence hung in the air. The only sound was the crunching of our boots on the frozen ground. The metallic scent of blood reached my nostrils, and my heart quickened. We cautiously entered the facility, finding it eerily silent and devoid of life. Signs of struggle were evident, with overturned furniture and shattered glass. A weak moan drew our attention to a corner of the room. There, we found a man, battered and bruised, close to death. His raspy breaths barely formed words as he croaked out a chilling tale. The scientists had been attacked by creatures in the snow, enormous beings resembling a snowy version of Bigfoot. Before we could glean more information, the man succumbed to his injuries. Determined to uncover the truth, we ventured into the nearby woods, where the tracks of the mysterious creatures led. The towering pines loomed overhead, their branches weighed down by the heavy snow. Following the massive footprints, our breath visible in the cold air, we felt a sense of unease creeping over us. The tracks led us deeper into the forest, but at some point, they disappeared, swallowed by the relentless snow. We retraced our steps, frustration mounting, and returned to the abandoned facility. The atmosphere grew tense as the shadows of the forest seemed to close in around us. Suddenly, the tranquility shattered as a menacing growl echoed through the trees. Massive, shadowy figures emerged, the creatures we had only heard about until now. Their fur blended seamlessly with the snow, and their glowing, predatory eyes locked onto us. Panic set in as the creatures lunged forward, teeth bared. A fierce battle erupted between our SEAL team and the formidable creatures. Gunfire rang out in the icy air, mixing with the ferocious roars of the creatures. Chaos ensued as we fought tooth and nail to survive, using every ounce of training to combat the relentless onslaught. After what felt like an eternity, we managed to regroup and retreat, calling for backup as we fled the treacherous woods. The creatures pursued us, their howls echoing in the Arctic night. Backup arrived just in time, and together we repelled the creatures, forcing them back into the shadows. As we caught our breath, I relayed the harrowing encounter to Commander Anderson. Skepticism furrowed his brow, dismissing our account as a result of stress and fatigue. However, the haunted eyes of my team spoke volumes, we had faced something inexplicable in the Arctic wilderness, a chilling menace that defied explanation. I wasn't there, but my son, son-in-law, and their friend saw a dogman. My son called me all freaked out that they had seen a Bigfoot because he knows I believe in Bigfoots. Now, my son always made fun of me for believing in Bigfoots. He asked me, Dad, can Bigfoots run on all fours? I said, yes. Why do you ask? And he said, Dad, we just saw one while out spotlighting rabbits. I asked him to describe what it looked like, and he said they were hunting rabbits with a spotlight, and he saw something hunched over. He said he then yelled to the others, and let them know that he had seen something, and then started to shine his light on it. At first, he thought it was a large bird because it was down like it was eating something. Then, it stood up on its hind legs and spread its arms out wide, and when other two came to look at it, it dropped down and took off faster than anything they had ever seen before. He said it had a dog snout and was covered in fur, but you could see it was very muscular. My son is six foot two, and he felt it stood as tall or taller than him. When it took off, they ran after it and watched it jump and clear a huge rock pile in one leap, like nothing. That scared them, and they all ran back to their car to get out of there. I spoke to all three, and they all had the same story and described it the same way. I told my son that's not a Bigfoot because Bigfoots don't have dog snouts. I told him, you saw a dogman. It's funny that this happened around a lot of cornfields. 
The area also had caves and was covered in sagebrush. A girl was on the first floor of my barracks where the female rooms were located. And she encountered a spirit or something in the form of an old African-American woman. The entity revealed its name and instructed her to deliver a message to, let's say, Corrine Brown Note. Not the actual name of the person, just a placeholder. The only person with that name happened to be the platoon sergeant on charge of quarters CQ duty that night. Immediately after the encounter, she approached the sergeant and described, in uncanny detail, her grandmother's complexion, name, and the message. While she didn't disclose the exact content of the message, she mentioned that it was highly personal, and the NCO burst into tears after hearing about this encounter. The night before I'm not claiming these events are related, but it's worth noting, some interesting individuals decided to conduct a sort of satanic ceremony, complete with a pentagram on the floor and the like. They invited me to join, but I declined. Although not particularly religious, I consider myself spiritual, and I couldn't see any benefit in participating. Besides, what if these demonic entities actually exist? That's a risk I'm not willing to take. After that ceremony, an eerie feeling pervaded the halls, and it all seemed too coincidental to dismiss lightly. When I was stationed in South Korea in 2008, I have a very clear memory of waking up to someone in my barracks room. I sat up straight in bed, and there was a ROK Republic of Korea soldier bending over near my fridge. I remember clearly that he was a ROK soldier, not a KATUSA, which are Korean army embeds that work with us forces. At the time, Katasis war modified to see us, but he was wearing the green BDU-like pattern of regular ROK soldiers. He was young too, maybe 20. I took a sharp intake of breath of surprise, which caused him to stand straight up and stare at me. I remember he looked just as surprised and confused as I was. Then he was gone. I had a hell of a time going back to sleep. Side note, I am female, so thinking someone was in my room was terrifying enough, let alone a ghost visitor. Last winter, right after the first snow, my mother and I were driving home from Coeur d'Alene. To reach my house, you have to cross the train tracks twice. After the second crossing is our neighbor's place, adorned with all sorts of eccentric signs about giants in the woods, government cover-ups, and the hoodoo legend of the Howler. While we are members of the BFRO, we always assumed these people were referring to Sasquatch. Little did we know that we might encounter something like Dogman. It was around 22, with clear visibility, as we passed the peculiar house. To my right, there's a bullpine tree line, and to the left, a hillside, with my property situated on top of the hill. My brights were on, and as I scanned the tree line, about 12 feet up, I spotted two red reflected eyes surrounded by a black mass with shoulders, no neck, and pronounced ears. The shock led me to ditch the car, not paying attention to the road. We were high-centered for about five minutes. Stepping out to lock my hubs, an overwhelming feeling of being watched rushed over me, hastening my task. Even when I got back in the car, the eerie feeling persisted. I quickly got out of the ditch and sped up the hill to the house. My mom questioned my unease, which she later understood. Around midnight, mom was jolted awake by the most guttural howling imaginable. She yelled through the house if I was awake, and I had already been listening to the sounds that we still hear occasionally. Later, I sought information from Mr. Bizvik, who runs Dogman Encounters on the East Coast. Armed with an AR-15, a 45 revolver, and A380, I tracked through the snow to the location I had seen the eyes. Surprisingly, there were no tracks in the snow. However, when I looked up the tree, around 13-15 feet up, there were claw marks dug into the tree, and a trail of claw marks led from tree to tree. The trail ended, 
giving way to a new one with the largest dog prints I've ever seen, stepping over large brush piles and bushes. What lay ahead was even more disturbing a deer carcass with no head, no hindquarters, and no vital organs. The neck bone was crumbled and shattered, both legs broken with no bite marks, and the ribs separated in a pattern indicating hyperextension. The snow showed signs of a scuffle, but coyotes usually leave the breast meat and back straps untouched. Moreover, I found a deer leg wedged in the fork of a thin pine about 12 feet off the ground, a height that couldn't support a bobcat. Since then, I've never ventured into the woods behind my house unarmed. My neighbors now perceive me as the eccentric one, dressing in full combat gear when setting trail cams. I may seem strange, but there's something in my woods that has the rancher across the street, believing a grizzly attacked his cows in November. Every neighbor hears the howls, and my landlord, when asked about his experiences, turned pale as a ghost. While I haven't had a sighting since, an ice ball was thrown at my car, and there are no kids in this neighborhood. I saw a dogman walking along the Greenbelt in Boise, Idaho. And to be more specific, the area would be Garden City. The actual location on the Greenbelt would be the area of the Greenbelt that is just on the other side of Veterans Parkway Bridge. For those not familiar with the area, the Boys River flows through downtown Boys and Garden City. The Greenbelt is a walking or biking pathway that is paved that goes right next to the river. It was 3.15 am in February 2008, and I was scraping the ice off of my car window. I had to be to work at 4 am. I realized that it was eerily quiet, I looked up, and I saw it walking along the greenbelt going towards the Veterans Parkway Bridge. The bridge goes over the Boys River, and the greenbelt pathway goes under the bridge. It was tall, I would guess over 7 feet. It turned its head and looked at me, it had green neon colored glowing eyes. I said out loud, oh my god. It turned its head back and continued walking along the greenbelt. It was walking slowly, I was frozen with fear and didn't move until I saw it vanish behind the building that is next to the Veterans Parkway Bridge. I assumed that it continued along the greenbelt under the bridge. It had dark brown fur all over its body. Pointed ears, long snout, weird legs, a tail. I got a pretty good look at it. That section of the greenbelt is at the end of a dead-end street and has a couple of business there with parking lots that are all lit up with street lights. I only saw it that one time. A friend and I were camping with my German Shepherd. We pitched a small backpacker's tent behind a large log. Around 11-12 o'clock, we noticed my dog whimpering very quietly. At that moment, we heard the sound of something crashing through the brush and trees just on the other side of the log. Despite being a very aggressive dog, it proceeded to try to crawl inside my sleeping bag. Next, we heard a whooping vocalization, which neither my friend nor I had ever heard before. After 10-15 seconds, our visitor took off at a run. As it ran, it made the very distinct sound of something running on two legs. I would like to add that even though I was only 20 when this happened, I was an experienced hunter and outdoor enthusiast. I am 46 now, and in 26 years of camping and hunting since the incident related above, I have never again heard that sound we experienced that night. My two cousins and I were the only people up there. They were swimming in the river, and I was sitting there when, all of a sudden, there was a horrible smell. I got a really scary feeling, and I could feel the hair on my arms stand on end. I turned around and saw, standing next to a tree, a huge, hairy man looking at me. He had a kind of bullet-shaped head, and massive, thick shoulders and chest. Though I wanted to call my cousins over to see him, I was scared to death to move. He turned and walked back into the trees. I waited a few minutes, then ran down to the falls to get my cousins. When we got back to the picnic table, 
We walked to where he was standing, and the grass was smashed down like a trail leading into the trees. They wanted to try and find him, but I said no way, and we got in our car and left. I made eye contact with Harry Mann. I could smell him and had the feeling of being watched. The hair on my arms and neck went straight up. I have never been that scared in my life. I looked around to see if I could see anything and standing in front of me about 30 feet away was what I'd describe as a very hairy man about 7 feet tall. He was standing next to a pine tree swaying and just looking at me. Then he turned and walked away to the woods. While driving toward town from the wilderness area, I witnessed what I thought at the time was a large six to seven foot bear walking quickly out of the wooded area. Crossing the road about 60 feet ahead, going toward the creek, which was also heavily wooded. I am a city boy and did not realize bears do not walk upright on two feet as Yogi does. Looking back I have to wonder what that creature was. In a Co. 258, there's a haunted day for the trainees. One night, I was on fire watch, and I witnessed someone in full BDS walking out from between the bunks and heading into the bathroom. Finding it odd that someone would be in full uniform in the middle of the night, I became even more perplexed when they didn't return after a few minutes. Curiosity getting the better of me, I walked down to see who it was, only to find no one there. I dismissed it as sleep deprivation and continued with my shift. Fast forward four years, and I make friends with a fellow veteran. It turns out we had both gone to the exact same basic training unit, separated by about eight years. As we reminisced about basic training, he brought up the topic of the ghost. Puzzled, I thought about it and initially said no. However, he proceeded to describe the exact scenario I had witnessed. Chills ran down my spine as I realized that I had indeed seen the ghost. Apparently, his platoon had been alerted to its presence by their drill sergeant. A few years before he arrived, a trainee had tragically committed S in that very bathroom. It was early June of 2016 in Broome County, New York, and three friends, Jamie, Dan, and an unnamed witness, decided to go camping in a local forested area. Apparently, they did not know if they were technically allowed to do this, but there are a lot of fire pits in the area, so they did it anyway. They set up their tent, got their fire going, and just sat there talking. All of a sudden, the woods became completely silent. You couldn't even hear crickets, and it apparently felt like there was a lightning storm because static electricity could be felt in the air. The hairs on the back of the unnamed witness neck stood up. According to Jamie, the air was humming. Immediately after this, there was a deep bass noise and a light flashed up in the distance and illuminated the whole forest. It looked like when a real big firework explodes for the first few seconds, but it lasted for about a minute before it split up into three or four other lights and shot back down into the trees. We could see the lights glowing out in the woods, and then there was a big gust of wind, and it was gone. Everything smelled like it had just rained, but it never did. The witnesses didn't know what to do but decided that it was likely just a meteor, and so went back to talking amongst themselves. At about two, they decided to go to sleep. The unnamed witness and Jamie slept in a tent, but Dan decided to sleep by the fire. Roughly an hour later, the witnesses are woken up by Dan shaking them, and saying that there was something big watching the camp. The creature was about 50 feet away from the fire according to Dan, and he apparently thought that it might have been a bear, but it was standing on two legs and bobbing backwards and forwards as if trying to get a better look at him. While Dan was talking to the witnesses about this, all three of them heard a loud scream that apparently sounded like a pig being slaughtered, but was deeper and made the witnesses' ears ring. Apparently, three or four more creatures came running towards the campsite, 
as the embers from the fire kicked up and landed on the tent. The upright canines kept running up to the tent, and then promptly ran back into the woods. Every once in a while one of them would scream again, and pull on one of the tent poles, dragging the whole tent a foot or two. By now the whole tent was collapsing on one side, and the witnesses were screaming as loud as they could. Suddenly everything went quiet again, and the witnesses ran towards their truck as fast as they could, and hit the gas. When they were just about to leave, they saw one of the upright canines illuminated in the road by the truck headlights. At this point, the witnesses attempted to gun it, and drive the vehicle straight past the creature. But it then straightened up and puffed up its chest. The witness estimates that the creature was around 8 feet tall, and had dark gray all over its body except for the front, where the hair was white or yellow. The face looked like that of a dog, but not really. Apparently, the witness knows what Bigfoot looks like, and this was different. The upright canine didn't even move when the witnesses drove at it, and they had to swerve the truck around it to avoid running it over. They drove back down the mountain, parked the truck in a gas company parking lot, and considered telling the local police, but were discouraged because they didn't know if they were camping somewhere that they shouldn't have been. In the morning, after the witnesses had sobered up, they drove back to the campsite to find that their property had vanished, including the tent and the cooler. I had a really weird experience about three months ago, while driving home. I had to move my mom from Minneapolis to Madison, Wisconsin, and I was driving home on one of my trips, moving her stuff alone. It was about 1 AM, and I was in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't in a town or anything, and I was really tired because I had been driving all day and all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I distinctly saw a person running out of the woods straight towards the side of my car. I was going about 65, and I thought okay, I've been driving too long, and now I'm seeing things. All of a sudden smack into the side of my car. I was terrified. It was pitch black out there, there was no traffic. There's nobody around, and there's nothing near me. I was just in the middle of nowhere. This came out of the woods. It ran into the side of my car. My car was dented. It hit me so hard. Out of the corner of my eye, I was really tired so I don't know what it was I saw, but I could have sworn it was on two legs, and it was probably about six feet tall or taller. In the corner of my eye what I thought I saw was a man wearing a gray sweatshirt and a hood. Art asked if she stopped her car I was too scared. I was in the middle of nowhere. I didn't understand why someone would come out of the woods and run straight into my car, when there's no traffic or anything. If they needed to cross the street, why would they wait until there was car coming? So I thought, I should call the police. Then I thought, what did I just see? What was that? What do I say to the police, that somebody darted out of the woods and ran into my car? So I drove home. I was probably about 30 or 40 minutes away, and I was shaking, I was scared. I don't know what had just happened to me. I got out to see if there was damage to my car. I thought about calling the police, and I decided it had to be an animal, because there was nothing around there. So the next day I looked in the papers, and I looked through everything to see if there were any dead bodies in the road, because that would have made the news, and there wasn't nothing. So I don't know if it was an animal or what it was. Another thing that was terrifying was that it was running very fast, very fast. That's why I thought it couldn't have been a person. I knew not to stop. I was going about 65. No blood. No hair. I checked for blood because I thought maybe I hit somebody. No blood, but you can see the dent. It's on the driver's side of the car, that's where it smacked into me. You can definitely see the dent, but it wasn't as big as I thought it was going to be. You can see it, but it wasn't like serious damage to the car or anything. This happened seven months ago, and since I haven't received any answers from anyone, I'll share it here and see what others think. 
I had just returned from my walk around 7 p.m. The sun was setting, and with an overcast sky, it was a bit darker than usual. For a little background, I live in Phoenix, Arizona one of those houses situated away from the main city, right by a mountain preserve. It's essentially connected to it, creating a very cool, but unsettling area, especially at night which is where I go on my walks. About 15 minutes away from my house, right in front of me, I encountered this strange looking creature about 10 feet away. It seemed to be floating, completely motionless, making it hard to discern its exact appearance. Below is a link to a drawing I made to depict what it looked like with glowing red eyes, one snapped horn, another full horn on its head, long black demonic arms with sharp looking claws, and wearing a dark, tattered cloak. I stared at it for about two whole seconds before it vanished, almost like fog. Then, it appeared again further down my walk, about five or six minutes later, even farther than before almost as if it was watching me from a distance. I was listening to my playlist at the time, and suddenly, a loud I mean loud horrible, high-pitched, blood-curdling scream blasted through my headphones in the middle of the song, and the creature vanished. It was the loudest scream I've ever heard, probably intensified because it was directly into my ears, but still, it made me drop to my knees. After that, it seemed to vanish. I didn't see it again, but the rest of the way home, I could feel a presence as well as a sense of being watched. I've had encounters with other creatures out here, but this one was probably one of the most terrifying I've experienced. I've shared this before, but people seem to get a kick out of it. Not much of a horror story, but my most interesting Craigslist sale was selling a 70s Buick for $1E500. I had a few calls, but no one super interested. Then I had a kid, maybe 21, call, and he really wanted the car. I told him $1E500, but I was willing to talk about it. He said, okay, I'll see you at 7 p.m. at this parking lot. I get there at 6.50, and he never shows. 7.30, I call but no answer, and I go home. At 9.45 that night he calls me actually apologizing for not showing and asks if I can meet there now. Sure, I just want to get rid of this car leaking oil in my driveway. I get there at 10, and he still isn't there. I get ready to leave at 10.15, and he rolls up in a Caprice Classic with giant rims on it. The driver gets out, two really skanky looking girls get out of the back, and the kid buying the car gets out of the front. He opens the car, pops the hood, starts it. Checks it all out. He takes it on a quick drive, while I am standing with the two skanky girls and the driver. He comes back, hops out of the car and waves me to the car. Kid. I really want this man, this is awesome. Me. Okay, well, I would like dollar one than 500. But what are you wanting to pay? Kid. I was only able to scrape together dollar one in 300, but I've got a good deal for you. Give it to me for dollar one in 250, and you can F her, pointing to the skanky brunette. Or let's do this for dollar 1000, and you can have them both. Me. I turn and look at the girls, my guess is they are 16 and look like they'd do it right here in the parking lot. Yay, I'll just take the dollar one the 300 and you can get the car. Kid. What? You don't think they'd be good? F man, that pussy is tight enough to rip your dick off. Dollar one in 250, and you can have the blonde. Me. No, thanks though. They do look like they'd be a good F, but I'll have to pass. Kid. All right man, you don't know what you're missing. I'll give you a two day window, if you want either of them just give me a call you can refund $1.50 or $300, and we can work it out. Me. Enjoy the car and thanks for the two days. He actually gave me $1.300 in cash and $155 of it was in ones. But I did not call him back to get the girls, my wife would have probably frowned on that.
Right so I've got a story. I've lived in Florida most of my life until October 2020 when I moved to upstate South Carolina. Lived with my grandparents in the mountains around Salem for a little while before moving to an outer suburb of Greenville. The backyard of my house in Greenville had a downward slope and a creek at the bottom, then a upward slope on the other side leading to another set of houses. The creek led into a large patch of woods one more house down past mine, a good 50-ish acres. Not long after moving in I went and explored the creek, and found a small shard of pottery half buried in the ground, it was dark greenish, and had a few basic floral designs on it. I brought it inside cause I was planning to contact the nearby university to ask if it had any significance, but I never actually got around to doing it. One day shortly after that, sitting on my back porch around noon, I start hearing whistles, like some guy was calling his dog or something. But it was the exact same tone and melody every single time. It never changed. I looked around and didn't see anyone, but I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from. It was coming from the patch of woods down the creek. The first couple times I heard it, then slowly moved out of the woods and into the backyard of the house behind mine. Again, I didn't see anyone, and it was still the same whistle, almost like it was a recording on repeat. This happened every couple days for a few weeks. Always the same exact whistle, and no one else to be seen but me. I didn't think anything of it at the time until I moved again late last year to Spartanburg County. Obviously I won't say exactly where I am, but I'm in the northern part in a very rural area, plenty of woods around along with plenty of coyotes and other wildlife. I hadn't heard the whistle in a long, while well, probably about a year. Couple weeks ago I was sitting outside my house about 9 p.m. doing a bonfire. I heard a pack of coyotes go nuts around a quarter mile away, which isn't unusual so I didn't think anything of it. After a couple minutes they went completely silent, and I didn't hear any other wildlife, not even crickets, then out of nowhere I hear the same exact whistle again. It was coming from a ditch next to the road in front of my house about 30 yards from where I was sitting. I froze and sat there listening as I knew that this time something was up. Why am I hearing the same exact whistle as I've heard in the backyard of a pervious house over an hour's drive away? I waited another few minutes and heard it one more time then silence. Another few minutes pass, then the usual wildlife and crickets started going again. The rest of the night I felt watched, and now every time I go out at night I feel the same way. I don't know if it's a walker for sure considering all I've got are a few identical whistles, but it's definitely not normal. Whatever it might be there's no doubt it followed me from Greenville over an hour away. I tried ruling it out by saying it's birds, but the timing is just way too irregular, surely I'd hear it more often right. Instead of a few times last summer, and then not at all until the middle of September a year later looking for answers on what it might be and what to do about it, if anything. As far as the pottery shard, it was left in a closet at the previous house in Greenville, which has now been rented out to another tenant. Any other questions feel free to ask. I agreed to meet with this guy once to buy an Atari Jaguar I'm a collector. I get to his house at the agreed time, and there's no one there. I send him an email while hanging out in my car, and he says he had to get groceries, but will be back in a few minutes. I decide to sit on the hood of my car and wait. His neighbors walk outside and yell to me. Hey man, you waiting on Jamal for games or drugs? Oh Jay just games. At this point, I kinda wanted to book it out of there, but he pulled up to the house right as I fumbled with my keys. In all, the guy was a little creepy, and was a complete dick to his daughter. His wife seemed nice enough though. Got the Atari, and got the heck out of there. Hey folks, for years now, I've been retelling a childhood experience to various friends to see if anyone has dealt with something similar. When I was probably 10 or 11, 
I was playing in a lower pasture on 80 acres of family land situated in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California with a friend and my little brother both were around 7 or 8 at the time. I remember vividly seeing a man standing just inside the woodline with the head of a stag. Dark, rough fur stopped at the collarbone. And it had an enormous rack that resembled somewhat the way tree roots look when they're blown over and pulled out of the ground. Its chest was white-skinned, muscular but athletic, and it had what I remember looking like stripes painted on it in a dark color. Not stripes like a prison uniform, but occasional long marks running down an arm or from front to back. I don't remember exactly what its legs looked like either covered in the same dark fur or wearing dark pants. Normally, I'd chalk it up to childhood fantasy, but my little brother and his friends swear they saw it too. Any similar experiences? It seemed more neutral in temperament than aggressive, so I'm reluctant to really label it a skinwalker. I've also had folks compare it to Cernunos. I saw an old Pioneer integrated amp, I liked bundled with a couple other items that the guy wanted to trade for a laptop. I emailed, asking what he'd take in cash for it. He said make an offer, so I offered $100. Apparently that insulted him, and we exchanged a few more angry emails, ending with me telling him something. When you get a shit laptop with a jizz stained keyboard, you'll wish you took my $100. To be fair, he was being a dick first. The next day he has just the amp up for $150. Why didn't he just tell me he wanted $150? The thing is, I still wanted it, so I just made a new email and went up to meet him. I was naturally a little nervous, but he wasn't a bad guy really. He had a lot of vintage audio equipment that he was trying to sell, and was getting jerked around a lot. I love the amp though, it was a great purchase. A few years ago, my mom and I were driving home at around 3 am. We turned onto my street, and as I was looking out the window, I saw the back of this super tall, lanky, whitish gray, hairless figure walking in between two houses and about to go behind them. I still remember seeing its spine because it was hunched over and so, so skinny. I was really freaked out, but I figured I might have been seeing things since it was so late. I stayed quiet, and my mom kept driving. A second passed, and then my mom turned to me and said, What the heck was that? My heart instantly dropped to my stomach. She saw it too. She said that when we turned onto the block, her high beams hit it. Its eyes glared like an animal's when the light hit it, and it had big, sharpish teeth and grimaced like it was angry at us, then turned and walked away. She described the same body as me and the same manner of walking, mentioning that it turned from us and walked back behind the houses. We were so terrified. We literally didn't know what we saw. She also mentioned that when she was driving to get me, she saw a bunch of deer on the way to the bus stop. But on her way back, when we saw the thing, she saw no deer whatsoever. I live in a pretty suburban part of New Jersey, but I do have woods around. My mom and I are still terrified by it, and I've never seen my mom scared of something like that, especially since she's seen its face. Does anyone have any idea what I saw? My parents gave away an old couch for free to a woman who lived on the fourth floor of an apartment building. She took it from them on one condition she didn't want to carry it up the stairs, so she told my parents that she would pay them to bring it up for her. Being both a bit strapped for money and just generally nice people, they agreed. They bring up the couch while the woman watched, and when they asked for their payment, she asked them, Do you like roosters? Instead of giving them money, she handed them probably the creepiest carved wooden rooster I've ever seen. This thing looks like the abyss gazing back at you. Then, she ran back inside. The whole situation was so ridiculous that they weren't even particularly pissed, and it's still in our house 13 years later.
My mom and I go on avid bike rides literally every night we hang out. Not too long ago, last weekend, she had an encounter. She was riding her bike with her headphones and down a very dark and open area of the trail when she saw movement and heard what sounded like a loud yell. No people camp in that area due to the shrubs being practically non-existent, and the trees are dead as well. She described it to me as the most she's ever feared for her life. Now, this weekend, we were coming back from our nightly ride, and I started getting a gut-wrenching feeling while passing a certain place on the trail. I could genuinely feel something watching us. All the hair on my body stood up, and it just told me to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible, while she tried to take her sweet time until she saw eyes in the distance. Naturally, I looked at the tree line just to be cautious, and with me having the brightest light, I got the best look at it. I can't even describe what I saw. All I knew was to get out of there at that moment. I love vintage and antique furniture, so when I moved into my first apartment, I didn't have much money so used Craigslist or Gumtree a lot. I found this amazing vintage wooden trunk advertised and arranged to pick it up. On the phone the seller sounded like a normal, elderly lady, but I went with a friend to help carry it into my car. Turn up at her house and, and things appear quite normal, she's in her 60s and quite middle class and appears quite respectable. She shows me the trunk and we agree on a price, and then offers to show me other furniture she has for sale in another room. I agree so me and my friend walk into the room, and it's crazy, it's a treasure trove of bizarre junk. There are taxidermied animals everywhere, like stuffed kittens wearing outfits in these little globes, just general weird shit. The lady then explains that she's selling it all for an older gentleman who doesn't know how to use the internet, explains that she has been widowed for 20 years, and how he is her new friend, and then goes into extremely graphic detail on their sex life together. My friend and I just politely nod during her rambling, and she starts to describe the orgies she has had since retirement and her preference on ex-toys and asks if we would like to see them. At this point I just kind of picked up the trunk and ran out of there. All I could think on the way home is that it must have been some sort of hidden camera prank, or she really was some sort of sex-crazed older lady. I'm not sure if this is a skinwalker or a spirit. I live in Southern California. About a week ago, I was staying at my boyfriend's house. He lives with his mom and stepdad, but they were gone on vacation, and we were watching their three dogs. The first night went fine. The dogs slept soundly in the master bedroom, while we were down the hall in my boyfriend's bedroom. On the second night, we crawled into bed around 9 to watch a movie but the dogs were restless, barking and growling in the kitchen. I had to get up multiple times to tell them to stop and go to bed. At 10.30 PM, as I was about to fall asleep, I received a call from my sister, who drove out to the desert Ocotillo to camp with her boyfriend. She was panicking. She mentioned hearing some kind of cackling, almost like laughter, but not entirely human sounding, followed by a very deep, almost fake sounding howl. It resembled hyena laughter but deeper. There are no hyenas in San Diego County, and she was sure it wasn't a coyote. They estimated it was within 200 feet from them. Both of them got so freaked out that they packed their things and got in the truck. Driving away, they saw nothing no other campsites, no people, and no coyotes. I calmed her down on the phone, and they moved to a different area closer to a ranger station and other people. I thought about a skinwalker because I had read posts about them before, but I didn't want to put that idea in her head at that moment. I ended up going back to sleep. About two hours later, I woke up to one of the dogs whining and scratching at our bedroom door. As I got out of bed, I heard what sounded like a car alarm, a horn going off. Looking out the window, I realized it wasn't our cars. I opened the door to let the dog in, and the sound got louder, coming from somewhere in the house. 
My boyfriend and I walked down the hallway and saw all the dogs standing outside the master bedroom. We walked inside and realized it was his mom's alarm clock going off at 12.33 am. We were trying to figure out how to turn it off, but none of the buttons were working. We pressed every single one until my boyfriend finally unplugged it, and it shut off. I found it creepy that the alarm would just go off out of nowhere. My boyfriend thought maybe his mom accidentally set the alarm clock before she left, and didn't realize it was for him instead of PM. I thought about it for a second, but then realized that this is the type of alarm clock you usually set the night before, and we had been there by ourselves for two nights already, and it hadn't gone off. If his mom had set it, it would have done so the previous night, not two days later. He brushed it off as a glitch, and we went back to bed. We told the dogs to go to bed, but they were still standing outside the door. None of them wanted to come in and lay on their beds. We went back to our room, and they all followed us, laying down on the floor. I told my boyfriend how I was freaked out about the dogs being antsy, getting that call from my sister, and then the alarm clock going off. The dogs followed us back into his bedroom, instead of going back to sleep on their beds in the master. He said it was weird but fine, which didn't make me feel any better. The only thing that kept going through my mind was that there was something in the house. I could feel it. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I called my sister and told her what happened. She said she had the same feeling all night, that something was near them, and she could feel it. She believed that something was messing with her, and because she told me about it, it came and messed with me too. I also believed that something was luring us out of the room with the alarm clock, and the dogs knew. That's why they followed us back into the room, and stayed with us the rest of the night. I don't know if it was a skinwalker for sure, but we were both in an area that has multiple Native American reservations close by. Whatever it was, it was trying to scare us, and it worked. Back in the winter of 1974 in January, I lived in Northern Maryland near the Pennsylvania border Mason-Dixon line. I was 18 and my wife was then 17. She belonged to our school's Bology Club, which was then something brand new. The club and the teacher went on the trip for the weekend to Muddy Creek, but came home a day early. They were visibly in shock and barely talking, including the teacher. They told us they had been canoeing downstream when they heard roaring from the bank. When they looked up, they saw a huge hairy man who began throwing boulders and logs at them, almost swamping the canoes. They paddled like hell and eventually got out of range and were hysterical when they came home. All of them gave the same story and one girl, a friend of ours, had started the weekend with brown hair, but it changed to gray hair, it was not dyed. At the time, the British Museum had a standing offer of one million pounds sterling for the body of a Sasquatch. I was poor, from a broken home, and saw dollar signs in my head. So, I loaded my 35 caliber Marlin with 180 Winchester silver tips and headed north to the creek. I hiked about a mile in the woods and began looking for signs along the riverbed and sand bars. It was about 15 degrees F that day, and the sand was frozen hard. Almost right away I found a bare footprint pressed into the frozen sand about 2 inches deep. It was 18 inches long, and about 5 to 6 inches wide with 5 toes and looked human. I hiked up the rocks in the hillside with my head on a swivel, and one in the chamber with the hammer back and the safety on. I found a rock perch and settled down to wait for my money to arrive. After a few minutes, the feeling that something was watching me got pretty strong, but I disregarded it thinking that I was just paranoid. I sat there freezing for hours but the feeling never stopped. By late afternoon it dawned on me that I had not heard any wood sounds all day. No birds, no squirrel chatter, nothing but the water down below. I finally hiked back to my truck and drove home, promising myself that there would be other days. The further that I got from the hillside the better I felt. I went back several times afterward, 
but never felt that same weird feeling again. In 2015, I was driving back from an ex-partner's house at about 11 p.m. in rural Lancashire in the north of England. It was late November from what I remember so it was a clear night, with a big bright moon and very cold out for England at least. To get to my home, you have to cut off the motorway and take a slightly rural route up a wooded road. It's not a large or dense wood, you can probably walk from one end to the other in 15-20 minutes, it's roughly a five minute drive through the trees. As I was driving along, the road twisted and turned as it always had the hundreds of other times I had used it. So I had to drive very slowly about 20 kph in case a car came around a bend too fast. There's always accidents there. And so I was raising and dipping my headlights and full beam as you do. As I turned a corner, about 30 feet in front of my car was a large scrawny gray figure at first, I thought it was a large branch that had fallen from the tree, so I crept toward it and put on my full beam. When I got within about 10 feet of it, the creature or whatever it was moved as though it was doing a press-up, pushing itself up with its arms, and my headlights caught its eyes which glowed like a cat do when you shine a light at them at night. I stopped the car, half expecting it to just be a deer, and ran out of the way, but the creature didn't move. It just stayed stationary, staring at me, giving me a good 10-15 seconds to look at it. It then slowly stood up on two legs, still looking at me in the car. It was big, the top of my car probably only reached the lower rib cage region, so I'd estimate it was probably 9-10 feet tall. It was pale gray, hairless and gaunt. I could see its rib cage and spine. It had long bony arms, probably each about 4 feet long, and large claw-like hands. The closest comparative description I could give is the gray, bony werewolf in the third Harry Potter movie. Once I had taken all this in and realized the situation, I began to panic, putting my car in reverse, but the creature then just turned and walked calmly, and silently, off into the woods next to the road. It did not run, it didn't seem scared or intimidated, it almost seemed disinterested. I didn't hang about to investigate the area, I went straight home and locked the door. I spoke to all my friends, and all but one of them thought I was joking. But she seemed to take it very, very seriously, having had a similar experience in a similar area a few years ago. She said it was a bad omen, and after doing some research, I can understand why. As I said, I don't really believe in anything, and I've never seen anything before. I travel that road at least once or twice a week, and have never seen anything since. Does anyone have any idea what it could have been? We don't have large animals over here in the UK, the biggest we get in my area are badgers and small and medium sized deer. Certainly, not that size, and surely deer would startle in the headlights and run. When I was 17. It was a really hard time as my family members all had different awful experiences clustered at once, and I cried myself to sleep one night. I woke up in the dark to see the silhouette of my mum sitting on the end of my bed in the pitch black. I've obviously flipped out. Was she playing and turned the lamp on? She was visibly upset and shaking and said, I thought you were dead, not, I dreamt, or anything. And I was freaked out told her I was fine, and sent her back to bed. The next morning when I woke up and went to the bathroom, there were what can only be described as bloody hoof prints. We have no pets, they weren't footprints, and no one was on their period in my house. It couldn't have been a stray animal because there was no way of it getting in, and I checked CCTV, we only have exterior though, and nothing. They were literal cloven hoof prints, and they started on my bathroom tile facing the mirror. They then go out of the bathroom onto the hall carpet, and there are only two other doors on that floor on the same left side. The bloody prints go directly towards the far door of my bedroom like they knew I was there. The prints stop facing my door. My floor is laminate, and there was no blood or any print whatsoever within my room. 
I can only say that whatever negative energy I was putting out that night was like an antenna, and something thought it would be able to feast on me. But clearly, God or Jesus Christ or my angels protected me, and for that, it genuinely brings tears to my eyes. I'm a Christian Catholic, but the truth of their corruption is so profound it's only by the devil's work their true exposure has been quelled thus far. My mum however is an atheist, but strange how her maternal instincts kicked in, because she sensed a danger like never before to her only child. I had at least two other experiences with things that weren't from this plane or frequency. These ones I actually saw. When I was 10 years old in the fourth grade, I had a horrible encounter of paranormal proportions. I was not on any meds of any kind or any drugs. I was a little kid, and at 3 a.m. the devil came to me. He woke me by levitating as a big black cat outside my window, and even though I was sound asleep, he made me aware of his presence. He appeared through my window into my bedroom. I was terrified. This big black cat was lying on top of my chest, staring into my eyes, and even though I had them closed tight, he made me see his eyes right through my eyelids. I could not talk or scream. My older brother was sleeping in his bed in the same room, and was sleeping, and not aware of what was happening to me. The devil hurts you psychologically. He makes you see and hear things. He made the bodies of the dead float around my room. I saw pain and misery, and when I saw him, the devil, in his own form, he was dancing on the stove in our kitchen, with the fire on high. My bedroom was right next to the kitchen. I was shown all this horrible stuff, and at that very minute, before I saw the devil on the stove, I was able to scream, God help me. My brother heard me, flicked the lights on and everything disappeared. When I ran out into the kitchen, the devil was laughing on the stove, then vanished. I told my parents everything. We were Roman Catholic. We had our house exercised and blessed by the church and our own family priest. I talked to my family priest to please ask God to heal my mind and to heal me from those horrific aberrations that transpired in my bedroom when I was 10. After a few months, I was able to sleep back in my own bed. I slept with my parents for months as I was scared that it would happen to me again, but it never did. Thank you Lord, I know you are there. I have seen the other one, the mean nasty red one with horns. He is evil and pissed off. Other than my immediate family, I only told my best friend from the fourth grade and my priest. He asked me 30 years later remember the cat in your room. I sure the heck do. The most important thing I learned from having that experience was, the devil wants people to think he is not real. Let me tell you. He is real and terrifying. I grew up in a little town called South Plainfield, New Jersey. Now, what I saw is kind of hard to describe so I will do my best. So, I was in my house in Modesta, California. It was late one night, and I got up to get some water. I heard this weird noise and brushed it off as it might have been a car driving by. However as time went on, I had this weird unshakable urge to go outside with my flashlight. I'd say about 20 minutes at least I waited outside while looking at a magazine. I had nothing better to do, so I sat outside on the deck for maybe 10 more minutes. I heard this noise. I got scared and jumped. I didn't see it right away. But when I did I almost soiled myself. I proceeded to shine my flashlight all around. What I saw was burnt orange in color, its ribs were showing, but it also looked very bloated. It had nubs where its arms would be. It had long skinny legs. Now the next part I will never get out of my head. What I thought to be teeth at first glance turned out to be several long single strands of white hair sticking out from its mouth. Inside its mouth was a very pale purple color, no tongue, no teeth, just looked hollow, its mouth was big and wide. It had its mouth open the whole time. It also looked like it had no saliva. It did not make any noise. It had some kind of goiter on its neck. 
I forgot to add it had lighter speckles throughout its whole body, and on the back of its head was a big black patch with a few small white dots. Now before you think anything I don't drink, and I don't do drugs. I wasn't that tired when I saw this thing. I'm still confused to this day. I just stared at it for a few quick seconds as it approached me. I was too scared to move, and then it ran off when I got up from where I was sitting. Ironically, it ran so fast like it was scared of me. What type of entity is he? I will not go into too much details since the entity watches me, knows my thoughts, and is around me almost all the time. I don't think this man is evil or anything like that, but very possessive. I don't need help to know if he's real or not. I've already figured out he is after dealing with him since I was 5 years old. I just want to know if there's a way to figure out how powerful a being can be. Has anyone dealt with something like this, and did you know if they were dangerous or could do a lot of damage? He doesn't want to hurt me, so I'm not worried about that. But I also have a knowledge that even when my body dies I won't be able to leave him. He gets mad when I think of him as a demon, or a god, or an angel like a negative pressure in my head. But if I think of him as a soulmate, then he's happy a relaxing tingling chill runs down my body. He doesn't say things directly, I have to use the pressure or tingles method to figure it out. Even typing this much information is making me feel ill. This whole thing is embarrassing to admit, I haven't told a single person in my life about this. I thought this was in my head, but it's not. Does anyone have experience with something like this? Is there different levels of entities or beings? Or is it just another soul, like the same one humans have? Could he actually be my soulmate from my past lives, and he just didn't incarnate with me this life? I am a 32-year-old female, and a virgin, I've wanted to be in a relationship, and I've had a good chunk of men throughout the years show interest in me, I'm not super attractive, but average looking, but it's never gone anywhere, like every event in my life was designed to keep me isolated. I'm allowed to fantasize about fictional men who look like him, but that is the farthest I am allowed to go. Can an entity do that? Can a human soul do that? Story. My husband and I were out cross-country skiing. We had just crossed a remote country road, and were about to ski across a field. On the other side of this field, we spotted an extremely large wolf standing just inside of the tree line. I felt uncomfortable as the creature was staring right at us, following our movements. My husband, carrying a 22 rifle on his back on a sling, brought the rifle down, chambered a cartridge, and fired into the ground in front of the creature. The creature looked at the ground, then back at us, and began to growl. The growl went up and down in sound, and it was very deep and menacing. My husband shouldered his rifle again, but did not fire. What really gave me the chills was the look on the creature's face. I felt that the creature knew that the rifle was small caliber, and was not something that could kill it with one shot. Moments later, my husband fired again, this time into a tree next to the creature. The creature didn't flinch, but what it did next made both of us flee in terror. About 30 seconds after the second shot, the creature stood up on two legs. One of its front legs arms was against the tree that my husband shot. The growling continued, but it had increased in volume, and the creature was moving its jaws up and down, as if gnashing its teeth. My husband fired three shots directly at the creature, all three hitting it in the chest. The creature let out a drawn-out scream or howl, and ran off into the forest on two legs. We fled the other way back towards our vehicle. As we were skiing back, we had to pass through a small area of the forest. As we were passing through, we could hear something running towards us from a distance through the woods. We cleared the woods without anything happening. But when we broke out of the forest, we estimated that whatever was chasing us was no more than 35-40 yards behind us. I had my cell phone with me, and was thinking about using it to take a picture of the creature. 
Suddenly, I got a feeling, that if I took a photograph, the creature would kill both of us. The feeling was so strong that I immediately shoved the phone in my pocket. It wasn't as if the creature sent me a psychic message, or anything. It was just a feeling. One thing I must mention, in a hushed, embarrassed voice. When we made it back to our vehicle, I noticed that I had actually peed my pants. I didn't even notice until the adrenaline rush ended. I had been so scared that I lost control of my bladder. I always thought that was, just something from the movies. As a former ranger, I used to work alone near the outside of Big Bend National Park here in Texas. It can be pretty secluded in certain areas. During my time, I can't even begin to tell you how many strange things I saw or heard. But this is one encounter that is still very fresh in my mind. Now, before I go on, I've heard and seen all sorts of incredibly creepy things. I've had my own skinwalker sightings, a Bigfoot sighting, and there are lots of things out there that go bump in the night that many refuse to talk about. If you meet the right people, they are usually willing to open up and speak about it. But you have to be careful, especially when it involves your line of work. It can definitely affect your career, and how you are viewed as a professional. If you're perceived as crazy or being a nut, good luck getting hired anywhere or advancing your career, especially if you tell people that you saw a skinwalker or a Bigfoot. This night though, something happened that I never thought possible. My work partner, another ranger, and I were on duty. We were both driving back from the station when we heard something very odd. It sounded like a woman's scream mixed with the sound of weeping. It was loud, shrill, lasting only a few seconds. The more I think about it, the more my skin crawls. We did not see anything out of the ordinary, just heard the sound. The next day when we checked on our equipment, one of the cameras was not functioning properly. It recorded the sounds that we had heard, but did not capture any kind of visual. Two weeks later, I heard the same sound while I was patrolling, right around 3 in the morning. It was unusually dark when I heard the sound. It instantly sent a chill down my spine, and the immediate feeling of fear gripped me. It was so real and so incredibly bizarre. I thought, what was that? It sounded like it came from a woman but not. I was alone this time and I certainly didn't want to be, not after hearing that. But the only thing I could do was call for backup. At that hour, I would have brought the fear of God to anybody who came out there with me. It sounded like somebody screaming. I mean, I'm not crazy. I know what I heard. I just can't explain it. I'm here to tell you that many people would write this off and just say, Oh, you heard a mountain lion. That's not what this sounded like. I've heard mountain lion and cougar on multiple occasions, and while they can sound like a woman screaming bloody murder, that's not what this sounded like. The tone was audibly deeper, and it just sounded different. I obviously wouldn't have been so terrified if it had sounded exactly like that of a cougar. Now, this would happen again for the few following nights. Each and every time, it would make my skin literally crawl. After what I believed to be about three weeks after the initial audible noises that I first heard, my partner and I were working together again, patrolling the same area at the same time. We both see movement off in the distance in the same direction that we'd heard the screams the first few times. My partner was actually the first one to see it and point out the dark figure moving in the distance. I had to squint my eyes and realize that what we were seeing is a creature moving with its mouth wide open, as though it was screaming. We watched it as it moved very quickly to the desert underbrush. The movement from this creature was as if it had glided towards the underbrush, and not typically run like a quadrupedal animal would. The only reason why we didn't immediately panic, was that what we were seeing was just so outrageously bizarre that for the first few seconds, we couldn't handle what we were seeing. Neither of us screamed, and we didn't run like it was some kind of monster ghost, but we did eventually hightail it out of there. I think we were just so shocked and stunned. 
I'm not saying that I know what this creature is that we saw there in Big Bend National Park, but judging by its physical appearance, it reminded me of what many people claim to be a ghoul. Ghouls are similar to crawlers or rakes in that they are all white and have very wide open mouths. I only know these things because I decided to do a little bit of research into cryptozoology after the sighting to try and educate myself on what it is that I saw. The main reason being I wanted to know if these things are dangerous or pose a threat. From everything I've read, they definitely do. I can't prove it was a ghoul, but based on everything that I saw and experienced, things all point to that. I don't want to just write this off as nothing because nothing will never terrify me as personally as this did. I've been having nightmares about it pretty much non-stop. I figured sharing my experience with the world is probably the best thing I can do. After all, this is not something that you hear about every day, but I know I did not want to go back there. I'm planning on making an official report eventually for the National Park Service, but we wanted to get more information out there from users. This is one of the many things that has happened over the course of my career. Feel free to ask questions. It was 2.30 am, and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side, reading, when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This happens from time to time. When it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here for nine years, and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dogman, I said. Holy crap, it was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulders up. The shoulders were huge, and its head was huge. It had pointed ears, like a German shepherd dog, and a long snout. Its mouth was slightly open, as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I could swear that thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, kind of raspy breathing. I started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, the grounds around it, and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 AM or later due to having severe spine issues, as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here, and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is that when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I am in the house most of the time due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later once I got the courage to tell him this had happened, and measured the area by the window. That dogman had to be at least 8 feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore, and yes, I have cautioned my neighbors the ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead, and her tent was really torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this has happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dogman. It really frightened them badly. A 
About three years ago, I encountered what I could only explain then as a deformed hyena. It was in the later part of the day under dusky conditions, and I was small game hunting at the time. I did not feel any fear because I was carrying my over under shotgun at this time. Its eyes were kind of strange, and I remember it had very pointy ears. Its head was almost cartoon-like as its snout had messed up overgrown hair. Its fangs look unusually long too. For some time before I seen it, I heard a very very long coughing noise, like a cat coughing up a fur ball. However this went on for a long time, so whatever did it had strong and large lung capacity. I doubt a lynx or cat could have been the noise maker. I have no idea if this dog-like creature was the source of this strange and long coughing fit. Another strange thing along this trail, I always seem to be under the watchful eyes of a high-flying turkey vulture. Now these are newcomers to Alberta, but a few mating pairs have been reported up here, and this is common local knowledge that no one questions. This coughing bout I have heard at least on before in this specific area. Never seen the source in the nearby dense boreal forest. This wooded area is kind of on the edge of oil exploration, and is an active work area now so I don't hunt there anymore. Which is too bad as it's chock full of small game such as rabbits and grouse. During this encounter the woods were unnaturally quiet, it's hard to move in many areas off trail because the evergreen limbs reach so far close to the ground an upright person would be stooped over to move at any kind of speed in many areas. Quadrapes have a definite advantage here over people and the area is also ringed with swamps and marshy very uneven goran that one could easily turn your ankle on. There were other strange moments then, I think when I did see this animal, I sat down on a large rock with my gun across my lap, and caught the first glimpse, as it was circling me I think to catch my scent on the wind. I just caught a glimpse of it passing behind a tree in the dusky light conditions. It had hawks like a dog. But as it came around the tree, still on all four legs I noticed the front legs were longer than the back legs, its back bowed upward, and I got the distinct impression its frontal back, chest and leg muscles were much more pronounced and muscular than its back legs. I believe the front coat was a lighter color with some reddish tones too. Looked like a hyena loose in North America to my own eyes. It w is not a black bear. I am very familiar with bears. It was canine-like, but not any canine I have ever seen before or since. My brother he was not there found a near perfect picture of another critter online, on another crypto site, and the picture was said to be taken very near the Wisconsin River. In the picture it looked like it was on farmland corral or fence line, in the early spring because of white and light snow cover was the near twin to what I saw that fall evening in Alberta. My encounter took place many years ago. I never had the faintest explanation for it until a couple months ago, when I randomly stumbled across Dogman on the internet. I was in my early 20s, working swing shifts at the time and commuting about 100 miles each way, so it was usually around 2 as in the morning by the time I got home. I saw the monster as I called it on the northernmost section of Trunk Road in the Matanuska Valley in Alaska. This area is roughly smack in between the towns of Palmer and Wasilla. I was only about 10 miles from home at that point, so it must have been around 2 am. Trunk Road is a narrow, two-lane road, consisting of nothing but twists and turns. The surrounding terrain is somewhat swampy and thick with black spruce. It was late October, days before Halloween. There was no snow on the ground, but it was cold enough to be wary of ice. I was driving an 82 Subaru SW, going about 20 miles per hour around a curve, when my headlights caught a large, dark figure up ahead. I'm bad at judging distance, maybe six car lengths away. I instinctively let off the gas, coasting closer. At first I assumed it was a moose, as the area is infested with them. But no, it was standing upright. Bear then. No, not a bear. It looked so strange. 
tall enough to be an uncommonly large bear, but far too slender, and it looked like it had spikes running down its neck and back. A Halloween prop. Odd but effective place for one. All those thoughts ran through my head in a fraction of a second. The car was still coasting closer, and I could see more details. It was standing in profile, gazing across the road. I could clearly see its wolfish muzzle, large, upright ears. The spikes on its back were in fact clumps of fur. Its spine curved in a smooth, very natural looking way. It was standing in the ditch, inches from the pavement. Because I was focused on its upper body, I do not recall anything about its back legs, or if it had a tail. I did see its front legs though. Very doggy looking, hanging awkwardly down and slightly toward its front, exactly as you'd expect if a dog stood upright. While it clearly had a canine look, there was still something off about it that I cannot articulate. It was perfectly still, and at this point, given the proximity to Halloween, I was quite convinced it was some sort of Halloween prop, because it was clearly not any kind of existing animal. I was deeply impressed and gently stepped on the brakes, intending to stop and examine it closely. Then it turned its head towards me. In the tiny fraction of a second that it took for it to swivel its head, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. The fluidness of its movement removed any and all doubt that this was some kind of prop. It was horribly, terrifyingly alive. The pale, off-white glow of its eyeshine in the headlights destroyed any possibility of a human in a costume. I think I sat there gaping at it in shock for a few seconds, the car barely moving by now, but still inching closer. As I was almost upon it, I think it could have leaned forward and touched the car if it had wanted I had to look up to see its face. Again I'm a bad judge of such things, but I am 5 foot 4. And it was a hell of a lot taller than me. Tall like a polar bear standing. 7 feet. 8. I really can't say. I snapped out of my trance and slammed on the gas. The car fishtailed and I prepared myself for death by monster, as I was certain I'd end up in the ditch. But the tires caught the pavement, and I drove like a complete maniac all the way home. I did not look back. I have only been on that section of road a few times since, never alone and never in the dark. For the next several years of driving that commute, I went 20 plus miles out of the way to avoid trunk road. The thing never made any aggressive moves, but there was something about it that felt very, I don't know, predatory. I never saw anything remotely like it again, and never heard any stories about it in the area. I just wanted to share an incident that I experienced in Point Pleasant, West Virginia where I went to high school. I was in a video production class right around the time, the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere was being made. So we decided to make a documentary. We spoke to a woman in her 70s who, during the time of the original sightings back in the 1960s, said that she was out riding her horse one day, and she said she suddenly felt someone sit down behind her. All of a sudden the horse bucked her off and went crazy. She chased the horse down and then looked at the horse. Burned into the flesh of the horse were the legs of a humanoid. She immediately got in contact with a veterinarian who came to their farm to treat the horse. The veterinarian never asked how the horse got burned as if he had seen this type of burn before. Other than the burn, the horse was fine. Later that week, she confided to a friend that whatever it was that sat behind her on the horse had very thin, insect-like legs. She also said that it had the odor of ammonia. She also said that when she was backed off the horse she caught a glimpse of the being on the horse. She saw huge butterfly-like wings that were yellow in color. She swears up and down that this was the Mothman. Also, it turns out that the veterinarian was one of the 46 victims who died during the Silver Bridge collapse on December 15, 1967. I just thought that was an interesting story. Let me preface this letter with a quick description of my background. 
I am a retired military veteran with three decades of active duty serving my country and its citizens. I've been honored and privileged to be in command on many occasions during my career, and have seen both the bounty of peaceful time and the horror of all-out war. You name it I've probably seen it and been through it in the S military. I do not write this to impress, I merely wish to state the facts so that you may judge the accuracy of what I'm about to tell you. So now, the facts as I know them to be my first face-to-face -face encounter with Dogman. It was five years ago in 2019, and there have been more since then my first Dogman experience took place in the western United States. I have a cabin in a national forest which is nestled in a beautiful valley located 50 miles up a dirt road at a fairly high elevation, and is only accessible from late spring to late fall depending on how early or late the snowfall is each year. Most years it is impossible to get to the cabin from Thanksgiving through Labor Day due to heavy snow and ice on the dirt road that runs up to that part of the national forest. But four years ago in January, there was no snow, and since it is rare to be able to go there at that time of year, a friend and I decided to risk it and go up for New Year and planned on staying a week or so. We decided that if snow started falling while we were there, we'd retreat from it quickly and drive out in time before the road became impassable and safely make it down the mountain. We launched from the city, got to the cabin around midday, and found there were a few inches of snow on the ground around it. Ever alert for animal tracks and prints I examined the snow for them I found bear, deer, cougar prints, and something else I was unfamiliar with and had never seen before. I now know that they were dogman tracks. Not knowing what the dogman track were at the time I first saw them, I filed them away in my mind as a new experience and a new bit of data. Then my friend and I began powering up and commissioning the cabin, turning on the power and the water and the gas. The cabin has living quarters on one side and a huge garage with two huge aircraft style hangar doors to slide open. I unlocked and opened the hangar doors about six feet wide. Then my friend and I began unloading the supplies from my Jeep parked in the carport and took them through the hangar and into the cabin proper. As the afternoon progressed we settled in, restocked the cabin supplies, and cleaned a bit here and there. I never go unarmed into that wilderness, so one of the first things I like to do when I get to the cabin is to lay out whatever weapons I have brought with me on a big table out in the hangar. I did this and checked and loaded all the weapons. I also turned on and stocked the gas-powered refrigerator which I keep out in the hangar with some of the food I had brought that needed to be kept cool. Then I returned inside the cabin proper and settled in for an adult libation and an afternoon and bowl session with my friend. After a bit of telling stories between ourselves, I noticed the sun had set behind the mountains and it was beginning to get dark outside. It was time to begin prepping for dinner. I told my friend I would get some steaks out of the fridge in the hangar and went to do so. That's when something completely unexpected happened. As I walked through the door from the cabin into the hangar, I took one, two, three steps and froze. I was being sighted by something outside. It was staring at me through the open hangar doors with murderous intent. In that split second, all the hair on the back of my neck and arms stood straight up and I started getting what I call my gut warning. I've only gotten those before when flying into live fire from the ground, or when in other combat situations in wartime. Yet, here I was in the middle of the American wilderness getting the very same well-known sensation stronger than ever. I was pretty certain that it was not a human. I didn't freeze but my brain began racing. Instead of walking to the fridge I quickly went over to the weapons table picked up a large gauge handgun, checked if it was loaded, and stuck it in my belt. Then I picked up one of the already loaded rifles. Once armed I then advanced towards the open hangar doors with the rifle in my hands. I got to the open hangar doors I raised the rifle and started appraising the situation through its scope, swinging it to the left and to the right. It was so dark by then that I could see little but vague tree shapes, and the blobs of bushes outside in the forest. 
Then suddenly, as I swung the rifle to the right, the feeling of being intently watched switched off, like flipping a light switch off. I stood there for a bit waiting for the tingle of my intuitive gut warning sign to reappear. After a little while the feeling of being watched didn't return, so I closed and locked the hangar doors, grabbed some dinner steaks from the fridge, and went back inside. Later that night after dinner and KP duty, I armed myself, opened the cabin door, and stood in the doorway. As soon as I did the feeling of being watched started up again, only not as intense as the first time. I stood there for a while, and then once again the feeling of being watched switched off like a switch. The rest of the evening I turned the sequence of events around and around in my head, but could not make any sense of this creature. It just didn't add up. Could it have been a murderous bear that had gotten a taste for, long pig human flesh? All of these thoughts and more went through my mind as I sat there gazing at the wood stove fire in front of me inside the cabin and eventually, I gave up obsessing about it. I told my friend we should hit our racks so we turned in and slept straight through the night with no further incidents. You're probably asking why I didn't leave the cabin the next day. All I can say is that I am perhaps a little too stubborn, and have never believed in retreat of any kind. To me, that is paying for the same ground twice, and you have to remember that I've been going to my cabin for 20 years now and have never experienced anything like being watched or hunted. Not ever, not even close. The next morning we did the usual shower and shave routine, and while having a cup of coffee outside in the carport, the feeling of being watched returned, only it was weaker, as if it was from a distance. As the feeling of being watched returned, I still couldn't make heads or tails of the situation I found myself in, but I was adapting as fast as I could. So, I told my friend we would be staying close to the cabin for the duration of our stay. I didn't want to take any chances with this new unknown threat, so I told my friend that I was concerned about bears in the area. My friend took this at face value, and agreed to stay close to the cabin, and its immediate grounds for the duration of our stay. In the days that followed, I got the sensation of being watched from time to time during the day, but it was always weak and seemed to be from far away. But every time I opened the cabin door at night, and stood there looking out into the night, the feeling returned very strong and very close, like it was that very first night inside the partially open hangar doors. I forgot to mention that I have a pair of Generation 3 military night vision goggles, I use these every night when standing at the cabin door looking for whatever was outside watching us. Each and every time I put the goggles on the feeling of being watched switched off as I explained earlier. This whole situation was darn peculiar, and I just couldn't explain any of it in a rational way that made sense. All I knew was my training from the past, and that if I stuck to that, then my friend, and I would be okay. If I developed a plan for the day I felt it would be alright, and after all, we had plenty of weapons and food. The procedure I settled on was simple. Don't go outside at night, don't leave any doors open, and stay very close to the cabin at all times. Most of the time we sat in the carport on folding camping chairs just shooting the breeze. Also, keep yourself armed and have extra firearms close at hand, and most important, never ever go anywhere alone. By midweek, after being at the cabin for four days, we began to get used to this watcher, because it too was following a set of rules and never came into sight. It stayed a certain distance from the cabin. It made absolutely no noise at any time at night. It came closer and stared at the cabin and waited for me to open the door and look around. As soon as I used the night vision goggles, it took off and so forth and so on. On the fourth day at the cabin, my friend insisted on going on a hike. I sensed that I would have the opportunity to figure out who the watcher was. I was using my friend as bait for what I was mentally calling the watcher but I really wanted to know what this thing was. I figured my friend would be safe with me well armed, and watching them from a distance. So we agreed that he would hike down the dirt road for a short distance, and then come back. My friend got ready to go, 
excited to get away from the cabin for a spell. I armed myself well. I holstered and put a large bore revolver on each hip. I double checked the load on my R15 and slung it in front of me. Then, at the last moment, I don't know why, I slung my old trusty full auto machine gun on my back. It is what you might call the spoils of war, and has never failed me in the past. My friend was ready to launch down the road, and I was just as ready to watch him do so. He took off and I watched as he walked down the cabin access road to the main dirt road. As soon as he was out of sight I jogged over to a knoll that had a commanding view of the road and the entire valley and worked my way into some old growth bushes. From there I watched as my friend started going down the road and within an instant I saw something else just off the road behind my friend. It was big and black and stood upright on two legs and it was fast. It had a weird flippy floppy zigzagging gait, but it zipped from tree to tree incredibly fast, following my friend as he walked down the road. In an instant, I knew that this thing was the watcher that had been spying and watching us all week, and it was not a bear. I raised my rifle and tried to see it through the scope. My first glimpse of it was its head and upper body. It had the head of a dog. I swear it had the head of a huge dog. A little stunned I suddenly remembered my training and lowered my rifle sight to its legs. I saw huge muscular legs like those you would see on an Olympic heavyweight lifter. Its short dense black fur became sparse going down to its feet, and those toes had huge curved talons, not nails. They weren't quite as big as the velociraptor dinosaur talons from the Jurassic Park movies that everyone in the western world has seen, but they were almost as big and they looked incredibly lethal, like overkill, lethal in a split second. I took this all in. Then I pulled the rifle back up to sight on its head and chest, and it was staring back at me, staring directly at me from about 100 yards away. I got a good look as it stared at me. It had a huge head, I would say much bigger than a human. It had short smooth black fur and a huge jaw that was slightly parted. I saw large white canine teeth in its mouth. Its eyes were deep dark red, and as I watched, it started to squint its eyes and really got a good look at me. The longer I looked at it, and it looked back at me my brain tried to compare it to other dogs I've seen in my life. To me, its head looked like a cross between a German Shepherd and a Black Lab. But it was huge, absolutely huge. I got the sense that this thing was mean and pissed off. I instinctively decided to shoot it. Just as I put my finger on the trigger of my R, and was about to pull it, I was interrupted by the noise of a vehicle coming up the dirt road in the distance. I stopped sitting on the beast for an instant and looked down the road, and then I swung my gaze back to the beast. It was gone. I lowered my rifle and scanned for it, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was running away, faster than anything I've ever seen run. It ran through the trees so fast it was a blur, and was running on two legs. Then it burst out of the tree line, and went to all four limbs, and actually increased its speed. It started going through a boulder field, and then took off upslope at such a terrific speed that I remember saying to myself out loud, You've got to be kidding me, nothing runs that fast. I watched as it got to the steep granite mountainside across the valley, and it just went straight up it seemingly floating over the rock, it was so fast, and it was gone in seconds. I tried to process what I had seen. As the vehicle came up the road, it was a West Forest Service Jeep with a ranger inside making his rounds for the week. The ranger stopped and talked to my friend down in the road, and I watched as they chatted away. Eventually, my friend finished talking to the ranger, then he started up his Jeep and drove off. My friend started hiking back to the cabin. When my friend returned to the cabin, it was late in the day, and I told them we'd be leaving the next day. Obviously, I walked around outside the cabin heavily armed after that. A little while later I noticed the ranger in his jeep parked down at my access road gate. I walked down there to chat as I've known that guy for about the past 10 years. We talked about nothing for a few moments, and then I said, 
Hey, have you ever seen or heard reports of a huge dog running around these parts? The guy looked at me oddly and very coldly said, We don't talk about that stuff. Without another word, he started his jeep and drove off as I was in the middle of saying, What do you mean? What aren't you saying? What's going on? I looked back up the road thinking to myself what the heck is going on up here. It's never been like this before and so forth. I walked back to the cabin. I couldn't get the image of that dog face with the red eyes out of my head that night inside the safety of the cabin. My friend chattered on about how good the hike was while I listened absentmindedly, I replayed over and over in my head, the events of that day. My mind kept returning to the image I had seen in my rifle scope, and began filling in details that I hadn't noticed in the heat of the moment of that first real look at the creature. I finally got a few hours of sleep and slept in a bit. The next morning I woke happy to see the daylight and thinking for the first time in my life that I'd be glad to leave the cabin that day. But little did I know our last day at the cabin would turn out to be the strangest one of all. In the mid-1980s, I was told about an encounter that occurred not too far from State College, Pennsylvania Center County. A 19-year-old local resident happened to be looking out his bedroom window, which provided an excellent view of a pasture just west of his house. It was early morning about 6.30 a.m. local time, but there was plenty of light to see clearly. He was in the process of getting ready for work. When he looked out the window, he noticed a tall, hairy creature walking in the pasture, coming from the north. The creature was taking long smooth strides, and its arms moved back and forth as a human would. It did not appear to have a neck, but was capable of turning its head, as it was constantly looking around. Except for the face, the creature was covered entirely with brown or black medium-length hair. The witness was able to see the face and noticed that the forehead protruded distinctly. Also, it appeared the nose was wide and pushed close to the face. The height was approximately 8 feet. As the witness observed, the creature continued walking until it was south of the house. Suddenly, the creature stopped walking when the witness noticed two other similar creatures join it. Both were about about a foot shorter than the first. At this point, one of the creatures reached down and picked up a piece of lumber that was part of a new shed being built. The larger creature started walking swiftly towards the house until it was within 50 feet of the residence. It stopped suddenly, made a few loud grunting sounds, and glared toward the window from where the witness was watching. The witness ducked and crawled to the far end of the bedroom. After a few minutes, the witness got up and looked out the window. The creatures were gone. Later that day, the witness and a friend discovered large, unusual tracks in the pasture. It's not known if this incident was ever reported, but I do know that at least one local police officer knew what had happened and confirmed it with me. He seemed to be convinced that the witness was upstanding and honest, but very private. The witness did move away from the area not long after the encounter fearing that the creatures would harm him. You know that Indian folklore and part tells the truth. I'll explain. Back in December 2001 to be exact, I went on a cruise to the Caribbean. It was a Royal Caribbean cruise. On our third or fourth day, we landed in Puerto Rico. One hour into port, a group of 10 of us got a tour guide for just about an hour. Well, the tour guide was explaining spots of interest on the island. But since it was like a rainy overcast day, he said that it wouldn't be possible to visit those sites. He took us to the beach in San Juan. We all got out, the sun was out just for like 20 minutes. I was married to my ex-wife at the time, and I was taking pictures of her just a couple feet from our tour bus. Well, I saw the clouds coming in, the cloud was shaped almost like an arrow, and at the tip of the arrow were two giant birds. They both had white rings on their necks, one was way larger, and the other one was about the size of a Cessna propeller airplane. 
I yelled to the tour guide to look up at the clouds and repeated to all the members to look up. But by that time, the two giant birds went straight up higher than the clouds. Then the rain came down and we quickly got into the bus. Nobody believed me. I took pictures of the cloud. I still have them, but the birds weren't in the view. Indian legend says these birds bring rain clouds to villages that are in need of rain for planting their harvest. In a way the Indians were right. I live in North Carolina, Durham specifically. My family lives in a standard two-story house in the middle of a run-of-the-mill neighborhood lots of intersecting roads etc. On the night of the question, my family was going to visit a relative who had given birth recently in Greensboro, so I had the house to myself. I was getting home at around 8-9 pm and decided to bring my dog in. She stays outside in the kennel for the day until we bring her in for the night. Our house has a garage attached to the left of it, and the garage has a back door that leads into the backyard. Her kennel is just to your right as you exit the door, with a 4-5 feet clearance or path between it and the garage there is also a bed of rock just up against the house, which will be important. She had recently been taken to the vet for her distressed behavior, which is why I had to stay home to be with her. The evening went fine, I watched a movie to pass the time. I then took her out to use the bathroom before being put up for the night, around 12-1. I took her out the back garage door with her long leash, I was wearing socks and didn't feel like getting them soaked. She usually does her business in that little clearing between the kennel and garage, so I let her walk through it. Our garage has a single light on the back wall, not LED or really bright so I can see her somewhat well while she does it. She's facing me when suddenly her backside lifts almost one or two feet into the air. I assumed some wild dog or something had tried to drag her. She runs back to me and I hear rustling among the rocks and this figure stops right as it enters visible view in the light. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was tall. I'm six foot two and I had to look slightly up to see where I thought its head was. It was pale but not white or gray, just a normal pale flesh color like someone who spends a week or two indoors. It was lanky, not really anorexic or anything but definitely disproportionate. It looked at me for a good one two seconds before it backtracked in the quickest manner I could ever replicate. As soon as it went I booked it back inside. I was torn about calling the police if neighbors who had heard my scream hadn't. Behold almost half an hour later, the police arrive in my driveway, I told them that I had seen a man in the backyard, leaving out the whole tall demon crap going on. I have been contemplating whether it was some creature or some NBA bound nude meth head. Once again, I don't count myself as a believer in the Bigfoot or Mothman. But I really don't know WTF happened. I'm most definitely not taking the dog out alone anytime soon. What the hell is was thing? Why was it in a suburban neighborhood? Should I bother telling my family when they get back? I was driving up to visit my dad in Clear Lake, California. I was on a route that took Highway 20 which winds through hills and rocks that sidles along Cache Creek in some spots and goes through Indian Reservation. I left really early in the morning to try and get to his place around 6 am. I hadn't seen him in some years, had never been up to his place there, and wanted to go fishing with him, his retirement pastime. So I'm rolling along about 3 am, it's dark as f out there and I come around a turn onto a straight section of the road. I can see down the road far enough to see the next bend, and across the road looks like there's a parking lot. I can see the silhouette of cars parked on the opposite side of road, but as I approach something seems off. It looked like there were 15-20 cars parked randomly around the dirt between the road and the drop down to the creek, and at least a dozen or more people just kind of standing around. Not all together, not really in groups of more than two randomly dispersed around the cars. 
No fire, no flashlights, no headlights, no interior lights. It was like they were in stasis until I got closer. I could see heads turning my way, and one of the people starts running toward the road as I approach the corner trying to wave me down. Nope. I gassed around the turn and left them in my tail lights. I've come to understand that there are outfitters that lead rafting trips down the creek, but at the time of year in question, it's too low for that. Debutief were all of those people doing standing around in the dark. Why would they need to flag down some rando in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night? It just had bad vibes all around, and my instincts have served me well over the years, so that as they say is that. Lived in eastern Kentucky all my life, a cousin and I were out just walking through the hills when she took a step her leg fell through an old wooden box, and when we started looking around there where rocks standing up in rows we kept looking, and there was an old bigger rock someone had scraped the words only little ones buried here it was an old graveyard of all kids. Our family owned the land for almost 80 years, and no one knew it was there. Of course when we told it they all went to look. Then one day me and my same cousin, and a neighborhood kid went out again, we found a small cave, nothing unusual about that in the hills, but it had old chains bolted to it with some kind of old rusty cuffs. Like for people there were also old rusty cans and a pot way up a mountainside. I've always wondered why they were there and who was chained up. Quick stop after snowboarding at Snowbowl in Flagstaff, Arizona, one early evening in winter. Not dark yet, but nearing sunset. Found what we thought was a secluded and romantic place before my partner, and I would be going out separate ways for a couple weeks. Pulled off on a forest road right off the mountain, walked a short distance and noticed I was not alone. There were dead animals littered on the ground next to me. Not just any though, they were all babies. Different species as well, foxes, javelina, coyotes. I tell my partner who then sees more dead animals over where he is about 20 feet away. We realized they were everywhere. We felt extremely sickened and got out of there fast. This has been about 8 years back, but it was clear none of them were used for their meat, and all were destroyed, bellies cut open, weird stuff. Honestly it was so disturbing, I did not want to look closely. Did report to game and fish non-emergency and never heard anything back. In the middle of the hills. Riding my horse through the hills my horse started snorting. I smelled a back smell, but my nose was runny anyways from allergies. My horse kept stopping and wanting to turn back. I had to go forward or I could not get to where I was going. We got to a big rut like where a stream once was, and there was a big tarp with cinder blocks on top of it. My horse was so nervous, he rushed past it real quick jumping over it. I turned around to look and saw an arm. This was before cell phones. Rode home fast as I could and told my mom. The cops came and I had to show them where it was. Long story short, turned out to be a hooker. They figured she had only been there a day or two. My friend and I trespassed into the old and abandoned train station in our town. It was a huge abandoned complex with a three-story office building on one side and the giant wooden and concrete station on the other side with three four stories. This place had been abandoned for 20 plus years at least. We already knew that within the last 5-10 years, someone had been cooking meth in part of the building and a fire broke out. So one end was pretty burned down. We came in at the second story of the station to see the roof and floor caving in to the first level from the fire. As we continued on the daylight was no longer reaching the interior of the building, so we turned our torches on. We saw proof of a homeless population living there, but no one was around. We kept on through the building trying to get to the other side, where there was more natural light that would lead out toward the office building. 
Okay, so the creepiest thing I remember seeing in this very old, very abandoned and filthy place was all in one room in the middle of the station. The ceilings had to be 15 feet high or more, and on one end of the wall in one cavernous room were cages. These cages or cells were as tall as the ceiling. One cell could easily fit an elephant I swear. But these cells were immaculately clean. The metal wasn't tarnished or rusting, and there was even brand new wooden boards along the top and bottom of these cells that looked like they had just been installed. There was nothing in any of the cages. We left the station and went to the office building, where we found two dudes stripping copper from the walls. It was unnerving because we were two girls in our early 20s, but neither party said a word, and that's when we left. In college, my girlfriend at the time, and I needed to find an apartment for only one semester, which was impossible to find affordably in a college town. We ended up looking on Craigslist and living in a 2BR with this guy, let's call him Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan was in his early 30s. He was pretty much a stereotype nerd. Really tall and chubby, a gross beard and really long gross hair loved dungeons and dragons and video games and stuff like that. But he seemed nice, and he had a fully furnished apartment, and the rent was low. Dirty Dan became a terror to us. Here are some of his traits. His nice demeanor turned out to be the stereotype, nice guy behavior. He was Loki an asshole, and thought that acting polite entitled him to female attention. He didn't go to school or work, because he received social security for some undisclosed medical problem. Which meant he never left the house ever. Which would be one thing, but he never left the living room, despite having his own large bedroom. He spent all of his time in there, including constantly falling asleep on the couch for hours and snoring. We basically could not use the living room unless we wanted to hang out with him, which we didn't, because he drove us crazy. When we had friends over and did use the living room, he would just sit there awkwardly and silently on his computer, while we were hanging out or watching a movie with them. Then he would try to watch let's play videos on his laptop with the volume up and no headphones while we were all there. Or he would fall asleep while we were all watching a movie and snore. He also only laid down, never sat up so he always took up half the couch. He would invite himself to things we were doing, like we would be leaving to go somewhere, and he would just leave with us and invite himself. He got into some polyamorous relationship with two incredibly annoying girls. They would always be over in the living room too, and they spent most of their time discussing their sex life loudly, or looking at BDSMP on his Wii internet browser. He acted super creepy to any female friend we brought over, and as soon as they left would try to friend them on Facebook and hit on them. He would drink all of our alcohol. He was super passive aggressive, bitchy and paranoid. He became convinced that we were legitimately going to try and steal his cats after we made a passing joke about it. He was totally filthy, wore the same like thermal man leggings and t-shirt every day, the bathroom and fridge were disgusting when we moved in, and if we didn't diligently clean them, he would let them become disgusting again. We grew to basically spend all our time in the apartment in our room, and absolutely hate having to interact with him. He had no social graces at all, and was passive-aggressive bitchy, and I heard more about his mountain troll sex life than anyone should. Kill Dirty Dan. had just bought an old house, needed some roommates to help pay the bills. It was pre-GFC, and I doubt the bank would have lent me 300k plus on a 35k salary today. The few people who responded included a girl who wanted to know where she could put her five wardrobes, and another girl who wanted to know what equestrian facilities I was offering. Even though I kept telling her that it's only equine link, was that there were horses in a paddock on the other side of the road. Okay, but do you have an arena? How many seats does it have? 
Eventually I was forced to lower my already very low standards, and took on some very sub-par housemates. Housemate 1 was as skinny as a rake, and took my, hey I'm cool, you can smoke whatever in the big shed if you want to mean, hey, why don't you and all your mates spend every night in the shed blasting Metallica through tiny speakers, leaving bongs everywhere, and using my jars of nuts and nails as target practice. Housemate 2 seemed like a better candidate. He was unmarried, morbidly obese and between jobs, but was a qualified former chemical engineer with no pets. Only he wasn't. Firstly, the day before he moved in he admitted that he had a Maltese Terrier, and had intentionally not mentioned it, because he hadn't been able to find a place that would let him have a pet. I hate yappy dogs, but to its credit, it was pretty chill. Later I discovered that qualified chemical engineer is code for I once worked at a paint factory. Then he started bringing very young boys into his room at random hours who he introduced as his nephews, even though they very clearly were not. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, they actively avoided me, and did not look or talk to anyone else in the house, as if they had been instructed to stay quiet. He and his dog would spend the entire day sleeping in his room. As in, he may emerge once or twice a day to use the bathroom or kitchen, but that was it. The dog had a bowl which he kept full of food at all times, which brought in mice from outside. I asked him to feed his dog by putting food in it once a day, and he informed me that wouldn't be possible as the dog likes to snack. I told him that the mice had to go and if that meant his dog had to go, then so be it. He took the bowl away. Predictably, this made him get even bigger. He must have been more than 200 kilograms by this stage. But it wasn't caused by him sleeping all day. He blamed it on the chemicals at the paint factory he once worked at. In fact, he was trying to get a disability pension, so he wouldn't have to work again. Eventually the arguments between Metallica housemate and Lazy housemate over the late night music got to the point where Lazy housemate took out an AVO against Metallica housemate because he threatened to stab his dog when he shouted at him to turn the music down. I decided the drama wasn't worth 2 by $100 per week, so I kicked them both out. A dear friend of mine who has since passed away hired a gardener through Craigslist. The gardener robbed him when my friend went to a different state for a wedding, and kidnapped my friend's roommate. Gardener stole his car, drove his stuff and the roommate to another state, dropped it off with the gardener's brothers where the roommate was held hostage for a day. The stuff including plasma TV was fenced during this time. My friend gets home from his wedding, and his garage door is open, other car is gone, and no one in sight. He walks inside to find his two dogs locked in a closet having eaten pillows for food. They needed surgery later. He calls the cops. Later that evening the roommate calls my friend for a pay phone. He was released by the brothers after all the stuff was fenced. But the gardener took the car and led police on a high-speed chase. The gardener spent some time in jail, and sent my friend a Christmas card that year, apologizing. This story is completely true, and if anyone wants more deets I can answer questions. It was told to me by my friend, I miss him very much at a restaurant in what I consider to be the greatest story ever told to me. It came up because one guy at the table was talking about how great Craigslist is, and my friend said, well, actually, let me tell you a story. In a really bad place of my life, meet a girl off Craigslist dated. Whole thing turned south pretty fast. But being in a really bad place in my life ignored all the warning signs. Broke contacted, moved away, moved on with my life. Couple month later, she sent me a text saying, I know what you did, that's a felony the cops will come after you. Now being afraid this woman I called her and said WTF. Apparently, someone posted a video of her onto one of those revenge porn sites. I told her I never did it, 
and I'm happy now and don't want to be dragged down by her because, I was happy now. Hung up and thought nothing of it. Fast forward two weeks, and she sent me a long text message, that she was the one that posted it there, and was hoping it would be the attention she needed to bring me back into her life. That's when I changed my phone number. Depression and Craigslist dating do not mix. Was looking for roommates somehow this person thought I was a girl. Kept sending d pics, and I kept texting I am a dude. He was like sure girl. The things I would do blah blah. Finally I had enough told this guy come to my house. Idiot shows up with flowers, I come out and tell look him a dude not a chick. He tells me tease throws the flowers on the ground. I sat there just shocked. Guy sends me a text a week later wish you would have been a girl with all that teasing. I was about 15 and had $115 from saving and Xmas money. I was looking through listings for guitars, and someone had posted a square Telecaster for $100. I text the number, saying I'm interested. Guy says he still has it, but wants $120 for it. I respond saying $110 is as high as I want to go. He says $120 or nothing. I respond saying that if that was the price I'm out. He then proceeded to text me for three days calling me an asshole and a piece of shit for not buying a guitar from him, and how good of a deal it was. Saturday rolled around, and the text had stopped, but around 11 pm, I started getting calls. He was drunk and still mad. At that point I blocked his number. Story time. I like to think Shenandoah National Park has a spirit of sorts of its own. I've camped with my old RV, cabined and lodged there dozens of times over the years, and have had some atypical experiences. For one, my husband and I will never stay at a cabin in Lewis Mountain ever again for reasons too unbelievable to write out on Reddit. For two, on another particular trip, I swear we were surrounded or followed by feral cats every night. Except there is no mention of feral cats in Shenandoah ever anywhere, or by anyone. For three, once I stupidly went hiking with one other friend a few miles north of Big Meadows. We started on the AT, but took several spontaneous trail spurs that branched off from the AT. We figured if we just followed the post at where the trial splits, we couldn't get too lost as long as we kept in genial idea of what direction we were going. At the end of the day, sun was starting to set. We were sweaty and getting tired, and as I looked down the side of the trail, and could see through the thick of the forest, a very large lodge built to look like a grand cabin with a sizable parking lot. I thought it was one of the lodging locations the park offers at first, and thought we were unlost for a moment. I figured if it was one of the lodges, we could use the bathroom, grab some food and get back to where we needed to go by walking back on Skyline Drive the only road in the park. So we deviate off the trail and cut across the woods, and make a beeline for the lodge. Except when we got down, the place was completely deserted. It wasn't run down or anything and definitely looked like it was maintained up until some time ago. It was a weekend in the summertime, no reason to close a place like this. I remember all the lights were out, and there were some beautiful stained glass windows. There were exactly zero people around, no cars no anything. If you've been to Shenandoah you would know this is pretty unusual. Anyways, we decided to get back on the trail, and eventually found our way out. However, for years now I have been looking for this place by car every time I've been back, and I never seen it again. I've visited all the available lodging locations and could never seem to find the place again. There isn't that many buildings within a few miles of Big Meadows, and I just don't see where I ended up that one time.
more disgusting than anything. Went to Shenandoah National Park in Virginia with a college buddy in my old RV. JMU is super close so he and I took some camping gear from work and headed up there to catch that per se meteor shower. Hiked a good ways in on an out and back trail that ended with a cliff overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains and was awestruck. I set up my two-person tent and he rigged his hammock with a tarp a few yards back and then we sat on a cliff and watched the stars go by. Here's where life got real for me. We go to bed pretty early that night, and around what I could only guess was 3 a.m., I start hearing tapping sounds all around my tiny tent. Now I knew it wasn't rain or him playing a joke on me, so I started to panic a little. At this point I've been fully awake or alert for 10 minutes, and can still easily hear this tapping. I finally grow a pair and decide to turn on my flashlight, and what do I see when looking straight up through the mesh top of this tent? Hundreds and hundreds of centipedes. They were falling like a gentle drizzle all around my tent, and I fled like I was on an Epsiota fear factor. Long story short, I didn't sleep that night obviously, but my buddy who was about 15 feet away was out like a rock. In the morning there were dead centipedes everywhere. I'm normally fine with bug or insects, but not swarms. Don't know how we didn't see any senti carcasses the day before, or when setting up camp. It was a typical day at work for me. Being a park ranger where part of the land is a swamp is a unique job. Because then certain things need to be done, no different than a fish tank or aquarium. Water is an entire ecosystem all by itself. I was halfway through my shift, and so far, it had been a routine day. All the rangers had their typical route or routes, and I was in the middle of mine. When minding your route, it's not exactly an exact science. It's more along the lines of something you get incredibly familiar with, then you notice when something is off. That's when it's your job to check it out or keep an eye on things. I was just about to keep on driving when I saw something peeking out from behind a cluster of trees. It was early afternoon, so there was plenty of light to point out that it was some kind of vehicle. So once I radioed in what I found, I switched off my car and started walking towards it. The air was thick with humidity, and moss was strung around the trees in thick clusters. The humidity around here can take some getting used to, and while I'm mostly used to it, there are some times when it's intense, even for me. Today was one of those times. The promise of a dense rain hung in the air, and it was badly needed. Even the few bugs flying around seemed to be lacking their usual enthusiasm. But one thing that didn't fit was the vehicle, which I could see was hidden away between a bunch of shrubs. How did it get here? And even better, how did no one spot it? I could see even from the road that it wasn't a sedan or something that could be easily hidden. As I got closer, I could see it wasn't just a vehicle, it was an RV and not a modern one either. This was an old one, easily a few decades old. The paint was badly faded, which went a long way to help it blend into the background. That's the thing about nature. Given enough time, it'll reclaim anything that's there. It doesn't matter if the environment is forest, swamp, desert, or beach. Nature is nature. Which meant I wasn't surprised that all signs pointed to nature making good progress at reclaiming the RV. It was covered with vines, and as I got close enough to see it in detail, I could see numerous scratches on the side. They were varied in size and length. Some were very shallow, barely making a mark, while others went very deep. They were all over, but most were centered around the front door by the driver's side. What happened to this RV, and how did it get here? It wasn't huge, but it wasn't small either. There was an enormous amount of water around here, and it could have conceivably floated in from somewhere, 
as the beginning of the swamp that went on for miles was right here. The other possibility, that the RV had just been placed here, was a lot more difficult to believe. For starters, there were no tracks leading either to or away from here, and we would have noticed someone bringing it in. So that meant it must have been slowly making its way through the swamp and connected water for a long time. But RVS, even back when this thing was made, were not cheap. So someone had to part with it, either willingly or unwillingly. And it was our job to figure out what this thing was doing here. Just looking at it gave me the creeps. There was no telling what lurked inside. Fortunately, I was saved from further speculation by my fellow park ranger and good friend Trent, who had just pulled up in his truck. He'd been on the job a year longer than I had, which meant he'd been here five years. Hey Charlie, he said to me as he stepped out of the truck. Is this it? Sure is. You ever seen it around here before? He shook his head. Nope. Have you? Never. That's weird. You're pretty observant, just like a few others are. Thanks. You're no slouch yourself. Appreciate it. So how did we not see it? Best I can think of is that it floated down here. You could see it happening by how the land slopes down. Something that sighs, plus filled with who knows how much water. I could easily see it. Right. Trent put his hands on his hips and stared at it. But something like that doesn't just get rid of itself. There's gotta be some objective reason and motivation to dump it. I see what you're saying. Uh-huh. The only question is why. I took a step closer to the old RV, and for the first time, I was able to see through the front windows. That was when I realized why the bugs around here seemed to be lacking their usual enthusiasm. I could see them crawling on the windows from the inside, and those that were outside were floating around it in a thick layer. That was all the cue I needed to radio in for even more rangers to help investigate whatever was inside. Because bugs just don't swarm somewhere for no reason. When the other rangers showed up, they slowly opened the RV door, and the smell hit us like a truck. It was so bad it made my eyes water, but Max and a few other rangers put on bandanas and looked inside. The rest of us stayed outside and kept watch until they returned a few minutes later. They wasted no time in shutting the door again before they get rid of their bandanas, and took deep breaths of fresh air. There's nothing inside but some weird writing on the walls and some candles that were used once for something, but are now just small stubs of wax, Max said. What do you think? Trent asked. Someone used this camper for something. Nothing good I'd imagine. That smell doesn't come from nowhere. No doubt. I have no idea what's written inside the camper, but it didn't exactly seem like something pleasant. I won't lie, I didn't like being in there for one minute, and that's not even because of the smell. Max took out his phone and swiped through it before he held it up for us to see. There were pictures of the RV's interior, which was just as old and faded as the outside. Definitely a throwback. Ancient carpets, cabinets that were older than I was, and curtains that were probably last in stores decades ago. But there was something more than that. The strange writing dotting the walls in several places made me feel weird. Uneasy. It didn't take me long enough to have enough of a look at the place, and Trent felt the same way. Once the team finished logging the find and reporting it to the authorities, we put a barricade up around it and went back to the ranger station. After enough time, the smell that had seemed to cling to everything began to dissipate. But I also began to feel slightly chilled. Not freezing, but like the temperature had dropped a few degrees. I chalked it up to the storm system rumored to be coming in later. When I was about to take my lunch, I grabbed my stuff from the fridge and looked for Trent. 
so I could let him know what was up. Trent, I called out. No response. Trent, I raised my voice louder. Still no response. I started walking around to look for him. He wasn't anywhere in the ranger station, but he couldn't have gone far. I had no reason to think anything was amiss, but after finding the RV, I was a tiny bit wary. Because even after all these years, I couldn't shake the old feelings that anyone raised around here inherited from a thousand campfire stories. And they all had the same message. Be careful of the swamps, or better yet, stay out altogether. Part of it is just tradition. For centuries, people warned others about venturing into a swamp. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in one as part of his job, I won't deny that a swamp can seem a bit otherworldly at times. Especially if it's a huge one filled with water. It's certainly captivating, but it can also be a bit overwhelming. Because if the woods can be both majestic and intimidating, a swamp is in a whole league of its own. There's nothing like being in a boat and seeing an alligator sitting or swimming nearby. And there's certainly nothing like being out here at night and seeing nothing but hearing a huge splash in the water. I stepped back outside into the thick humidity and called Trent's name again. What's up? That was when he came around the side and looked at me. There you are. I sighed. I just wanted to tell you I'm grabbing my lunch. Oh, thanks. I'll grab mine too if you don't mind. Not at all. I turned and held the door as he stepped inside and I followed. He grabbed his lunch and we settled down. I stepped outside for a moment because I thought I saw someone lingering outside. He said before he took a bite of his sandwich. And did you? I asked while I used my fork to scoop up some potato salad. No, but I swear I thought someone was out there. Watching us from down the road. It happens. Yeah. That RV we found is creepy. Sure is. All the info is going to the appropriate agencies, to see if they're looking for anything like it. If they are, they'll take it, and if not, it'll be disposed of. Either way, I won't be sorry to see it gone. The smell alone is awful. I've never smelled anything like that in my life, and you know I've spent my entire life outdoors and in nature. I nodded. I do. I've smelled plenty of bad stuff, but that was different. He paused while he picked up a few potato chips. This is gonna sound weird, but I don't feel good after being around it. Not like I feel ill or something, but like I feel off. Know what I mean? Yes. Trent leaned in closer, like he was worried about being overheard. Do you feel the same way? A little bit. I don't disagree that thing was beyond disturbing. Something about it just rubbed me the wrong way. It's all too weird. Exactly. Listen, I don't blame you for being a little nervous when you couldn't find me. So let's stick together for the rest of the day. No going anywhere alone. Just as a precaution. Sounds good to me. Cool. So we did just that for the rest of the day, which turned out to be slow and uneventful. But as we were closing up to leave, the storm that had been lingering finally started, and rain started to come down in thick sheets. Trent and I briefly looked at it before we glanced back at each other. Well, hope you have a good night, he said. You too. Drive carefully. You as well. Then we both ran to our respective cars, started them up, and pulled out of the lot and down the road. I was in the lead, and when I reached the road, I took a left, Trent went to the right, and we each gave the other a farewell honk before parting ways. The rain came down in heavy waves, and in no time at all, the road was drenched. It came down heavily for about 15 minutes which meant it had lightened up considerably by the time I got home. 
As I opened my window to use my pass to get inside, the smell of fresh rain hit me, and I felt immediately invigorated. The humidity had also considerably lessened, which meant it felt like it was at least 15 degrees colder from earlier. When the gate to my apartment building opened, I pulled into the garage, and parked in my reserved spot. Then I headed to the elevator, and rode it to my apartment, which was on the fifth floor. Once inside, I flipped on the TV. After about an hour of that, I heated up some leftover chicken and mashed potatoes while I watched a movie. Although the rain had slowed down somewhat from earlier, it still came down steadily all night, so it pounded on the building in a rhythm I've always found calming. Since I was in the mood for some ice cream, I eventually headed to the kitchen to grab some from the freezer, and on a whim, I decided to look outside the window. My kitchen overlooks the main road, and it gleamed in the night on account of the rain. There were several street lights outside, which gave the area some illumination. I was just about to turn around and get my ice cream when I saw it. From across the street, near an abandoned strip mall, stood a figure. I couldn't make out exactly who it was, but the shape was tall, in all black, and stood there watching my apartment. It was the last one that unsettled me. The figure stood there, looking straight up at my apartment. I had no idea if I'd been seen, but it didn't matter to me. The only clothing I could make out was a jacket complete with a black hood, which was hiding the face of whoever it was. I took a deep breath and tried to think logically, while ignoring the panic flooding through my body. After a minute or two, I took out my phone, and dialed the only number I could think of. Someone's watching your apartment, Trent said without hesitation when he answered. Yes. My stomach clenched as he spoke, because I knew what it meant. Same thing there? Yeah, just standing there, watching. Same here. What do we do? He paused. What can we do? Nothing's going on. So all we can do is sit and watch, and if something happens, act accordingly. Trent was right. Nothing was going on and I was never more thankful I lived in an apartment building on the fifth floor. I suppose I should say good luck. You too. You know where to find me in case. Likewise. Then I hung up. Then I grabbed my chair, set it up, and watched. And watched. And watched some more. But the figure didn't do anything. Didn't even seem to move. Eventually, I dozed off but woke up several hours later, having temporarily forgotten what I was doing, and why I was sitting there. The figure was gone. I didn't know if that was good or bad. So I quickly got up and went to every window to look around. Nothing there either. Then I called Trent. He answered on the second ring. Yeah. Whoever it was is gone. Really? No sign of anything or anyone anywhere. What about you? A semi-truck just drove past and blocked everything from view. Give me a moment. Then I heard a sharp intake of breath. Nothing here either. Then I heard him move around, no doubt to check the other windows. Nothing, I asked after a minute. No. All gone. Nice. Well. I suppose we should try to get some sleep. But you know where to find me. Back at ya. Good night. Then I headed to bed, taking care to put my phone close by. To my surprise, I actually slept well. So well, I almost forgot what had happened and drove to work in a good mood. The rain was gone, and everything felt crisp and bright. When I saw Trent at the coffee shop, we both stop at before work, he had the same upbeat attitude. But then we arrived at the park and saw numerous fire department vehicles around. Once we showed our IDs, we were let in, and it didn't take us long to find Perry, our boss, 
lurking around the station with the other rangers. Perry approached us with a weary expression. The smoke was dense, and the entire place smelled like ash. Someone made the call early this morning at about three. Smelled smoke, and they figured out it was coming from here. That old RV you guys found? Someone set it on fire late last night. Dumped gasoline on it and lit a match. All that's left is a few bits of metal and a lot of ash. You're kidding, Trent said. Perry shook his head. We have some camera footage of a figure or two in black walking around, but that's it. The funny thing is, we heard back, and no one needs the RV for anything. Not in connection with any important matter. We might as well head inside. It'll be a while. We followed Perry inside the ranger station, and once he headed to his office, we saw Max and a few others who had been there yesterday, and they looked exhausted. And Trent and I both said so. I had the worst night's sleep ever. Max mumbled while rubbing his eyes. I couldn't get comfortable, and every time I did doze off, I had weird hazy dreams. Can't remember anything, except I woke up nervous and panting. Like I'd been running from something. From the expressions on their face, I could tell without asking that the others had a similar experience. Oh well, Max continued. And between us, I'm not too upset about someone using that RV as firewood. I nodded. Me either. While camping with my Girl Scout troop in a farmhouse, we found that one of the bedrooms was swarming with ladybugs. Cute, seemingly harmless, ladybugs. Most of the ceiling was moving with them. The troop leaders insisted it was fine, but while going to sleep in a different room that night, and watching a few bugs trickle into the room gave me vivid flashbacks to a traumatizing dream I had about being swarmed by spiders as a very very young child. I cannot handle bug swarms to this day. I have no idea how you were able to handle those centipedes. I'd rather take a mountain lion or bear. This took place 20 years ago in Amman, Jordan. I don't remember the exact date, but it was June 1997 around midnight. I was 17 at the time, my sister was 14. She was trying to get to sleep in her bedroom, but it was a hot night, so she got up and opened the window. As she got back in her bed, something crawled through the window and stood at the foot of her bed. It was fairly dark in the room, with only dim light coming through the window. She saw a winged creature almost as tall as the ceiling, dark black with a crest on the top of its head like a pterodactyl. She couldn't make out any facial features or tell the texture of the body other than a slight sheen on the side, the light was hitting it. The most notable feature she noticed was its blazing red eyes as she described them. When she locked eyes with the creature, a feeling of shock, dread, and fear took over her. She wanted to scream, but no sound came out. She couldn't move or look away. She felt the creature tell her to not make a sound in her mind, as if it knew she was trying to scream. This lasted for about 30 seconds as the creature stared at her silently and motionless. Suddenly, the creature turned towards the window and darted outside like a spear with a whoosh sound as it exited. We lived in a fifth-story apartment with a 50-foot drop out the window. A few seconds passed, and she let out the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard, which made me jump out of bed in my bedroom and dash towards her room. I flipped the light switch on as I burst through her bedroom door to see her sitting up in her bed white as a ghost, shaking and crying. My parents woke up and came running to her room as well. It took about 10 minutes for her to calm down enough to speak coherently. She told us that she had a nightmare. A couple of days later, she told me what actually happened. 
She seemed reluctant and scared to recall the details of the other night. I didn't know what to make of it, and we didn't speak of it again as I felt that would be best at the time. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm reading an article about the Chicago Phantom. The more eyewitness accounts I read about, the more I thought of that night. I decided to contact my sister and tell her about what I'd been reading. She seemed to get mad about me bringing this back up for her. She retold me what happened and is still terrified to this day. She is angry with me for bringing the memory back to life for her, but I convinced her that the story needs to get out there because of what everyone is seeing in Chicago. Hopefully, this account helps somehow and sheds more light on whatever this thing was, if indeed it is the same creature that's turning up in Chicago. I was driving home. It was the summer of 2005, July correction or annotation appears on screen. Actually, it was the last week of June. I was driving down the highway. I was in the little Mazda car I had at the time. Out of the corner of my eye, on my right, I, through the windshield, saw what looked like a giant black bag or something flying in the sky. I was right about here when I first noticed it points to a spot along the highway as he drives annotation. This is the entrance lane of Highway 12 heading north or east from Walla Walla. I noticed over to my side. I didn't pay any attention because I thought it was a black bag flying around. It was right about over there points to a place over a field. And I looked back at the highway. I was driving. I got up here to the way station annotation, way station 51. Here's the airport to the left annotation, Walla Walla airport. The way station is right up here. Right after I got around the corner of this way station, I saw it with my own eyes. It was like humanoid like. It was human. I think it was humanoid because I discovered this thing was filmed in Mexico a month before. As I was going around this corner right here, this is the way station, this way station. I got right here and I could see it right here up in the sky, so I pulled over right here. I pulled over right by this guardrail. I got out right here. I stopped right here at this guardrail and it's flying above the wires, going in that direction east to west. It's flying across the sky like that. Just like that uses a crack in his windshield to show the direction it moved. Anyway, the next thing I did, I got out and I was standing there watching it. It went across the highway and was going across that field and angled towards that hill back there. See that, way back there in the fog. Points towards a field that one. See how it's higher than the rest of the stuff around it. The next thing I did, I got back on the highway. I raced up here to Sapalil and took a left turn so I could follow it that way. I got around the corner here and took a left turn on Sapalil so I could get in front of it. It was quite the experience. I took a turn right here at Sapalil. I went down the road. As I was driving along here, I got right here and I could see it on my left. It wasn't that far over. It was right over there, oh about, I'd say, a quarter of a mile, half a mile. Probably about a half a mile. I continued on up the road because he was already to this hump. I'm telling you, he touched that hump of that hill. It glided across the sky and used that hump over there to propel itself. He was heading directly to this silo up here points toward a silo in a straight line almost. I got right up here in this intersection this back road intersection. I tell you, there's no traffic out here at all. I got to this little four-way intersection right here, and I stopped. I got out of my vehicle. What I did was I turned around. I did a U-turn. I stopped right here. See the silo? He was coming right across the sky. He came at me. After my first stop back there on the highway, I could tell it was floating on some sort of triangular device. It looked like red hippity hops, and I said this before online a dozen times. 
And I'm not crazy, I know what I saw. Anyway I got here, I got out of the vehicle here at Sapelo, and he was, I would say, 50 yards away. He got right up to about 50 yards away. I would say he was 20 yards off the ground at the max. And he turned, and he started going off at that angle. I tried to follow him. I went down the road that way, but he went behind the trees back there, and he went right up over between those hilltops there. That one, and that one points at a hill and some trees. And he disappeared back in there, and mind you, the airport way back over there, so, I don't know, something strange going on around here. I got close enough to see this thing, and I watched a lot of the Patterson film, and I watched a lot of Sasquatch films, and I know what I saw. And you know what, I think it's military because I saw a cinch-like seam on his leg that made it appear like he was wearing boots. Some of the details I forgot to tell is when I stopped on the street. It had something hanging from the side that I thought was a dead dog. When I reached Sapelo and Smith Road, I was pretty confident it was a small dog. It was a dead dog hanging on a rope about three or four feet long. It craned its head at me when it turned and floated across the sky away from me. It turned its head like an owl. I mean its head stayed fixated on me as its body turned. I saw plenty of hair. I saw its face. I feel that people tend to criticize other stories like these, and make that person feel like they're insane. Regardless of that, here's my story. On the night of May 18, 2016, I was playing a popular online console game called Call of Duty Black Ops 3. I am an avid gamer, and tend to lose time when playing this game. During the wait between matches, I would watch random YouTube videos that popped up in the recommended section on the side of the screen. I'm sure many of you have had this happen to you, but somehow I ended up in the section about space, time travel and aliens. Some of the videos questioned the origins of humanity, if UFOs were real and the different types of aliens that have visited Earth. After spending a few hours on the game, and watching these videos I looked at one of my monitor screens to check the time, and noticed it was past midnight somewhere around 1am, I don't remember specifically. I decided it was pretty late, and needed to get some sleep. So, I turned off the console and hopped in bed. For some reason I could not get comfortable lying in bed normally. So I pretty much slept upside down meaning feet to the headboard, head to the foot of the bed. I know strange, but it worked and I fell asleep. Now this next part is important to the scenery of the room. If I could draw a picture and upload it I would. But I don't believe that to be an option on this specific site. I have a pretty nerdy gaming setup. I've always been into video games since I was a kid and friends of mine today say that I am an undercover nerd, because of all the electronics I have. My setup consists of three monitors, a custom-built PC, all the bells and whistles for live streaming video games, etc. Most nights I don't turn my monitors off, because when the computer goes into sleep mode the monitors just go black. You may be asking why I'm even typing all this out, but trust me, it becomes relevant to the rest of the event, which I'll get into now. So here I am starting to get really tired and my eyes begin to close. I don't remember going to sleep, but I do remember waking up. I woke up to the strangest feeling. I thought I was having a nightmare, and remembered that if you know you're dreaming then you're not dreaming anymore. I was awake, very awake, and I could not move my body. My head was faced towards my nerdy gaming setup, and all three of my monitors were doing that hazy, static, white and grey projection that everyone's seen in scary films. The weird part is that they have never done that before, ever. The light emitted from the monitors was so bright, that I did not notice what was standing next to me at first. I have a king-size bed on a frame that puts the mattress pretty high. 
This thing was at about eye level with me, so it had to have been about four feet tall. As I said, I could not move my body at all during this entire time, I could however move my eyes. I tried my hardest to turn my head, make a noise and scream but nothing would come out. I was paralyzed looking at this thing that got even more terrifying by the second. I started panicking and began convulsing violently because I didn't know what was happening. I could see this thing looking right into my eyes with its huge, dark, glossy black ovals as eyes, and skin that seemed almost lizard and really dark gray color. Eventually, I just blacked out after staring at this thing for a few very long seconds. I've never had a seizure, I've seen someone have them multiple times, but I have never had one myself. That is the only word I can think of that relates to what happened to my body after I began panicking. But if you have a seizure, you don't know you're having a seizure. So what happened? After blacking out I came to, still lying backward in my bed. All the lights were off in the room, the monitors were pitch black, and it almost seemed like everything was back to normal. I just laid there for probably 10 to 15 minutes, petrified as to what I just experienced. After slowly getting the courage to get out of bed and tactically checked my apartment for intruders, I sat down at my computer and looked at the time. I don't recall the exact time I got into bed, but I do recall the time difference between when I got into bed and when I got out of bed after the whole experience. The difference in time was only 30 minutes. So, within 30 minutes, all of this happened. It wasn't a dream. It was as real as I've ever seen anything in my life. I made an attempt at drawing what I had seen before my eyes, which is attached to this post. I told this story to my mother, and surprisingly she believed me. Just so you know I am 23, a combat veteran, and I don't scare easily. This is my attempt at letting you all know that I have been in pretty stressful situations, and not turned into a wimp like I did on this night. To be honest I quite enjoy scary movies, I find them kind of funny. But this thing was absolutely terrifying, and not being able to control my body while this happened made it even more traumatic. I wanted to type this up to get the word out because I know some people have had other experiences like this but are confused and frightened like I was and am. If something similar has happened to you, know that you're not alone out there. I was a skeptic about this type of thing beforehand, and I believe that is the smartest way to go about life until you are certain something is real with personal experience. There are a lot of videos and stories on the internet that are extremely fake, so definitely question everything you see if you're skeptical as well. However, after this night I am full-heartedly a believer. Aliens are real, and they are terrifying. I'm a truck driver, and I was heading east on I-80 up through to Illinois. I had stayed the night, well, the afternoon in Des Moines, Iowa to get some sleep. I got a fresh 8 hours of sleep, and I had just got on the road. It was about dusk, and the sun was just about to set. I was driving, and I saw a figure just ahead of me on I-80, and it was right on the side of the road. When I say right on the side of the road, I don't mean in the grass. Its toes were right on the white line. I slowed down a little bit to kind of see what was going on there and maybe avoid it. When I got about 50 yards from it, I got down to about 50 miles per hour and I could see it clearly. I had my brights on and everything. It was a man. Well, it looked like a man about maybe 5 foot 9, or 5 foot 10. Couldn't have been more than a hundred pounds soaking wet. And when I got up to him he looked at me, and I kid you not, he had no eyes, no mouth, no nostrils. There was no orifice on his face. He was pale white. No hair, no features whatsoever. There was a... It looked like a skeleton with bleached white skin. He was just kind of standing there facing me. 
I slowed down and as soon as I saw his face, he looked up at me. Boy, I flipped the hammer down from Illinois all the way to Chicago. I never looked back. My blood ran cold. My hair stood up. It was one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in my life. I was selling a motorcycle. The guy lived a few hours away and wanted to know a lot of information. So over the course of a couple of days we emailed back and forth. He asked for pictures of this, pictures of that, details etc. Then we spent another day negotiating a price via email. Finally he made an acceptable offer, and I emailed that it was good. Then I never heard from him again. Two days went by, and I emailed asking when he wanted to come get it. His reply was, oh I don't have that much money. Put a body kit up on Craigslist, and got contacted about a guy that lived about two hours away that wanted to come and buy it. I was working night shift at a bowling alley at the time. He called me about 6 p.m. on a Saturday night that he was almost in town to pick it up. I reminded him that we had not arranged a meeting place nor time. Also I was at work for another 8 hours, and the kit was 30 minutes away at my parents. He then began to blow up my phone bitching that he and his friend took off of work, and rented a van to come pick it up. Sorry bud, not my fault. The closest I have was when I was selling a 97 Corvette on Craigslist in 2012. It was in good shape and mechanically sound. I knew what the car was worth and had it priced fairly at 15k. I start getting hits from a guy who lives about an hour away about the car, and eventually he wants to see it. So we meet halfway in a Walmart parking lot. He leaves me the keys to his Denali and takes it for a spin with his wife, still manages to do a big burnout on his way out which whatever, that's what those cars are for. He comes back and asks if I would take 14k, I say sure, we plan to meet there again next week, I say I want a cashier's check, and he should bring his license so we can do a bill of sale as I would be pulling the plates. Fast forward the next weekend, we meet up again, he says he wants another test drive before he pulls the trigger. I say go for it when he hands me the keys to his Denali and off he goes again. 20 minutes later her rolls back up and says, I don't know something feels off, can't put his finger on it. I as what it is or could be, he says he just doesn't quite know. I ask him what he wants to do, and he offers me 12k. At that point I laughed at him, and throw him his keys and say, let me know if you change your mind as I hop back in my car. Then he stops me and says, no, I do want it, what about 13? At this point I realize he either brought all the money, or he isn't going to buy it so I say, the 14 we agreed on or deals off. He pulls out a cashier's check for 12k, and then gives me the other 2500 in cash so he had planned such an attack. Oh well, turned out fine for me, it just bothers me people are always up for trying weasel you out of money. Sold an iPhone on about 3 years ago, and met the buyer in a grocery store parking lot. The dude looked precisely like one of the cousins from Breaking Bad, even down to the boots. He told me if there was anything wrong with the phone, there were, ways of finding me. He then tried to give me $1.75 less than what we agreed to. When I corrected him, he stared me down for about 15 seconds, then handed the remaining money to me. After that show of bravery, I immediately changed my number, deleted that email, and haven't been on Craigslist since. I'm currently on vacation in northern Maine, 
at some families' houses near Moosehead Lake. Earlier this morning, I was walking along the edge of the lake and saw a large animal. Surface briefly. Managed to take three photos I'm sending your way. It was a grayish blue, with no real identifiable traits. Skin looked smooth, and had some lighter stripes. At least two of them, right next to each other. That surfacing was really short, and then they disappeared. I do not believe these are fish or seals, but I can't confidently rule anything out. Hopefully, you will be able to spread the word, and maybe get something more conclusive. If you want more information let me know. Apologies for the blurry photographs, going to attempt some better stuff tomorrow, maybe I'll see something. I lived in Germany as a kid in the 70s. As we lived on a US military base, two of our favorite places to hang out were the MP guard shack near base housing and the gorgeous German woods. Gen X feral children pretty much. Saw as much beauty as strange. At that time it wasn't uncommon to come across a tunnel or World War II stuff while in the woods. The one thing that stands out was seeing a person from a US military wanted poster in the woods just behind the base. We had seen the poster in the MP shack and recognized him immediately. At first they didn't take us seriously because we were kids. They did go look after as we each independently had said something like, third picture down on the right in the guard shack. There was a group declared a terrorist organization operating in the area at that time known to engage in bombings, kidnappings and political assassination. Targets included us military, police and other groups. I'm glad the group didn't directly aim to kill children as he knew we recognized him. He went one way, we went the other. Never found him. So not as fascinating as some of the stories on here but very real the same. When my parents left I had a mix of emotions of happiness and worry, but that's not important. It was around 10 p.m. at night, and I had gone downstairs to feed my dog, and I realized my back door was wide open. This wasn't unusual because I normally leave it open for my dog to run around outside and my back garden is fenced off, so I normally don't worry. After feeding my dog I went to the door and closed it and locked it. When I went back upstairs I thought I heard a noise of shuffling from somewhere around my house, but I just shrugged it off as my dog getting into her bed. I live on the third floor of the house so I have to get up on a ladder to get into my room. I sat there playing games for a couple hours, and I was about to sleep when it was around 1 p.m., but decided to get food before sleeping. As I entered the kitchen I found the kitchen door open a bit not fully, but enough for a person to fit through it. I dismissed it as my memory thinking that I had forgot to close it. Even though I swore I did as I was walking through the living room, I saw my dog sat in a corner looking scared and worried. For context my dog is a small French bulldog incapable of hurting anyone, so seeing her like this worried me a bit, but sometimes she gets scared at little things so I didn't think anything about it. Anyways fast forward to me being back upstairs. I felt myself drifting off whistled watching some random TV show I can't remember. When I heard my downstairs stairs creak this at first worried me, but due to how tired I was, I didn't realize what the sound actually was at the time. I started drifting off again until at one point I fell completely asleep. I remember waking up to a sound, I didn't know what it was so. I slowly opened my eyes, and to my absolute horror, a man with half of his body peering through the hatch leading up to my room. Somehow I don't know how I managed to pretend, I didn't see anything and closed my eyes, hoping the man would go away. I would say it was about 30 seconds before I heard the creak of my ladders as the man went down the ladders, but honestly it felt like hours. 
As I heard the door close to my brother's room, which you have to walk through to get to my stairs, I reached for my phone and dialed the police quicker than I could think. Surprisingly, it took them near minutes to show up to my house and did a quick sweep of my house to no avail. I slept at my grandma's for the night, but in all honestly, I didn't get any sleep. From then on, I was too scared to be home alone at all. And I always remember to lock my doors now. Not the middle of nowhere, but I remember I was in maybe fourth grade. Could have been a little older. And my friend and I were talking about how much we wanted Da Ouija board. We were on a horror movie kick. I was spending a lot of weekends sleeping over her house and watching B-list horror movies lol. Well after our talk about wanting a Puja board, we decided to walk yo my house which is several blocks away 15 minutes walk. A few blocks from my house there was a pile of garbage outside this business, and right on top, opened up, out of the box, there was an old Ouija board. No joke it was the craziest thing. My dad wouldn't allow it in the house lol. I was 17 years old left alone from Thursday to Sunday with our family's dog, who was pretty small and starting to have trouble climbing stairs in his old age. I'd be working every morning while my parents were out of town. Came home from my shift on Friday and everything about the kitchen table was a mess. Napkins were taken out of the holder, all of the mail was thrown on the floor salt and pepper shaker on the other side of the kitchen but together, and one of the chairs pulled far away from the table. Our dog's never done anything like this, and I'd be especially surprised if he was even capable of climbing on top of the table. I reset it all. Saturday, I come back to find the exact same configuration. Don't have the pictures anymore, but every detail was just as I found it the day before. Pretty much the entire night, I'm convinced there's gonna be a ghost coming to get me, and I sleep horribly and barely rest for work on Sunday. I leave for work and make sure the place was orderly when I left, because I knew my parents would be back before I was out of work. When I go on my lunch break, I call my mom and ask about all of the details from the past two days, and she just goes, yeah, why did you leave such a mess? She didn't get pictures so I can't verify how similar the mess was, but regardless I can't believe my old dog would have done that, for the details three consecutive days, and I don't even know if he was strong enough to move the chairs or climb on the table. Only time anything like this ever happened while I was left alone. Creepiest thing I ever saw in the woods hands down wasn't in the middle of nowhere, but behind our house on Durfee Avenue across from Leg Lake in California. As the map in the link shows this was hardly the deep wilderness, but our backyard ended in a cliff overlooking the Witterer Narrows natural area, a small national park. There we would see deer, coyotes that the park rangers denied existed, Lol coyotes are everywhere in Ella County, and red-tailed hawks all the time. My sisters and I would go walking in the park occasionally looking for wildlife and birds. One day we followed a deer trail to a clearing covered in torn bloody clothes. Saw no body parts, but there were blood-covered and shredded woman's underclothes and blouses. We got out of there in SAP and told the rangers, but they refused to believe a bunch of kids. I thought a bear might have been responsible, but my mom thought it more likely the work of the, the Skid Row Stabber who was in the papers at the time. My brother 12 and I 14 were alone at home, while our mom was away somewhere probably away for work or SMTH. It was like 1am, and it was raining like crazy. I was about to head to bed, 
and I saw my brother had turned off his room's lights as well. I went to bed and fell asleep. My sleep was promptly interrupted by loud banging on glass. It was coming from our living room's glass door. I was scared a little but decided to check. I opened my door a tiny bit my room was straight across from the living room's glass door, and take a peek through our almost pitch black living room toward the glass door and spot someone on the other side of the glass standing in the pouring rain. I couldn't really make out what that person looked like, and I didn't really try to find out, as I immediately pulled myself backward to prevent him from seeing me. The banging didn't seem to stop, and it was mind-numbingly loud. It really felt like the glass was about crack at any moment. I got on my knees and hands and tried to crouch toward my brother's room checking if he's okay. There were some chairs in the line of sight towards the floor, so while crouching it would have been hard to spot me. I got to my brother's room and opened it. He was terrified sitting in his bed in the corner of the room. And just as I was about to grab the phone and call the police the banging stopped. I decided not to call because I am introverted af, and I honestly was just really tired so I went to sleep. To this day, I do not know who that was. I was in the desert last week climbing a mountain, where there was no trail, and stumbled across some rocks that looked like a person piled them on top of each other. The first thing I thought was that it looked like someone buried a body there. Not even five seconds later, I looked over and saw a very large bone that looked like it belonged to an arm or a leg. I took a photo and saved the coordinates. I told a few people who work in ecology, but they were going back and forth on whether it was human or bighorn sheep. Bighorn sheep are in the area. They finally decided on sheep, but it still kind of freaks me out. Many years ago when my now 28-year-old daughter was still an infant me her and our dog were at the apartment we were living in at the time. My wife was at work, I was sitting on the couch watching TV, my daughter was asleep on a blanket pallet on the floor, and the dog a German Shepherd or Wolf hybrid mix was about 10 feet away laying in the doorway between our kitchen and the living room area. At any rate, I was watching whatever it was that I was watching when all of a sudden, Thor our dog starts with this low level, guttural growling. I figured that he had heard someone in another apartment or walking by through the parking lot, and don't think much of it. As a few seconds pass, I notice that it's getting louder and I can see out of the corner of my eye that he has lifted his head up off his paws, his ears are perked, and he's looking up at the ceiling over where my daughter was laying. I look up, don't see anything, tell him to knock it off. Right after I tell him to knock it off, he jumps up, starts circling my sleeping daughter literally walking around the pallet she's laying on, and growling more and more intensely even stopping once and outright snarling and snapping his teeth. All while staring up at the ceiling. After about two minutes of this, and me having no clue on what to do since I can't see anything, and I do not want to reach for my daughter with him circling her like that. He laid down next to my daughter, rested his head on her back, and stayed there for almost an hour. Still intently staring up at the ceiling and occasionally growling. To this day, I have no idea what the hell was going on, or what he saw or sensed. But it was extremely creepy to me. I'm not sure this post belongs here, or if it's better suited for the glitch sub, but I keep thinking about it, and it was just so weird. I chose hypnagogic as flair, but it's probably properly hypnopompic. Yesterday morning, I woke up around 7.45am to my cell phone ringing. I didn't bother to answer, 
because for the last two weeks I have been getting spam calls early in the morning from an unknown number. When I have answered it in the past, there has only been silence, so I ignored my phone. It woke me up enough that I got up to use the restroom. When I returned to my bed, I picked up my phone, and was surprised to see that I had a missed call from my mom's landline 12 minutes prior. My mom is in her 80s, and would normally be asleep, unless something was wrong. My older sister lives with her, and I knew if something was wrong, she would call in too and my phone would be blowing up. But after all, it was from the landline, and I found that odd. So of course I called back. And of course my mom sleepily answered, asking if I was okay. I said, I'm okay, are you okay? My phone woke me up, and it said I had a missed call from you. She said no, she was asleep and so was my sister. Now, if the missed call was from her cell, I would have dismissed this as maybe her rolling over on it, or accidentally calling me somehow. But it absolutely was from the landline. She has an old cordless with physical buttons, and no memory dial. I apologized and told her to get back to sleep. Later, I wanted to show my sister that the landline had called my phone early in the morning. But when I went to my missed call log, there was no such call on the list. So the only thing I can think of is I was dreaming, and continued to dream as I went to the bathroom, came back, checked the phone, only to be awake when I called my mom. I was awake the rest of the day after that, I didn't go back to sleep. I don't know, it's been on mine since. I know phantom phone calls are thing, but could I really have been having such a realistic lucid dream or hallucination? Me and two of my cousins found a girl's clothes back in the woods in Akron, Ohio when I was little, right off of East Market on Maslin Road in Ellet, by this small dam that people used to swim in. Some random tissues and stuff like that were laying around too. A purple and white Arizona jean shirt, and the rest of her clothes. All of them. We were 9 or 10 and the clothes looked like she was probably around our age. That was the worst feeling. We didn't even talk that much, it just got really awkward and kept walking. Later into my teens, people used to tell some pretty crazy stories about those woods, and a lot of it was supported by things we would find back there wandering around, little campsites, and just a bunch of really bizarre shit. This happened when I was around 5 years old at my home. I was in the bedroom and my mom was sleeping in the bed. I was awake. Then I noticed that there was something lying on the chair by the desk that looked like a cat at first. By the way at the moment our family had a cat and a dog, and I remember seeing both of them in the room. It was a one bedroom apartment so don't be surprised that we all were in this room at once. When I approached the chair to see what kind of cat it was I saw that it was a weird creature or an entity with a body of a cat and a head in the form of a pumpkin. As most little children I didn't feel fear but rather interest. I decided to pet it, but when I tried to do so the creature who had been sleeping prior to this moment suddenly hissed at me which scared me. So after I removed my hand it went back to sleep. The cat and the dog were minding their own view signs, not noticing anything strange. For many years I had been sure that it was not a dream, and told this story to my friends when we had conversations about paranormal situations we encountered in our lives. But as I grew older the feeling they, this was absolutely real faded away, and I started questioning this experience, assuming that it was just a vivid dream of a child. But several years ago I stumbled upon a post in a group of our country's local social network that described the very same creature. I was astonished. Unfortunately I can't find this post now to reread it. 
Later I came back to this memory several times and tried to Google it, but never found any other accounts. Also this took place in Russia in the early 2000s where there was no Halloween culture with all this pumpkin stuff. But I admit that I can still see such an imagery in an American movie, and just forget about it. Interestingly enough, when you Google, a cat with a pumpkin head, there are plenty of images of this kind. I think the one that I saw looked more natural. I mean the pumpkin didn't have cut out holes, and the head was a part of the body, not just something worn on the head. Have anyone heard of or encountered a creature like the one I described? I am rather skeptical to this story, but would be interested in hearing more if anyone has something to tell. So, this thing happened about four years ago, but I'm still thinking about it. I was in my parents' house, chatting with my friends online, and it was around 2 a.m. I decided to go to the bathroom, but the moment I sat down on the toilet, I heard three loud knocks on the door. I didn't say anything because I assumed if it's any of my family members, they can wait until I get out. After that, I heard some noises from the living room nearby, which sounded a lot like someone grabbing something from the table. So, I was pretty sure it was my dad who knocked, and now he's waiting for me to come out in the living room. I left the bathroom to an empty living room, and then I saw that all the family members were deeply sleeping. I asked them the next day if they knocked on the door, and they said no. Any ideas about what happened? I'm not the biggest believer in the paranormal, but this experience is something unexplainable to me. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.